what does it take to change the world? A big army? A cure to a pandemic? A revolution? All of these take either a lot of people, thousands of hours, or massive amounts of space. But for Julian Assange, all he needs is one room, an internet connection, and the world will listen. Assange is located here, and more specifically, right here. And from that location, he's posted government secrets, classified documents, and leaked emails from some of the world's most powerful people. And in doing so, has been labeled a hero, a villain, a nihilist, and everything in between. This is how an Australian programmer sequestered in the Ecuadorian embassy in London became one of the most influential and notorious people in the world. Born in 1971 in Townsville, Australia, Assange has always been on the move. Living in over 30 homes by the time he was in his mid-teens, Assange, along with his mother and half-brother, finally settled down in Melbourne. His introduction to hacking started at 16 when he was given a Commodore 64, which he attached to a modem. He attended the University of Melbourne, where he studied programming, physics, and mathematics. He never graduated, but that doesn't mean he didn't get an education. By 1991, Assange hacked into the Pentagon, U.S. Navy, and other branches of the U.S. government. In 1996, he was caught by the Australian Federal Police and charged with over 30 counts of hacking and computer-related crimes. He didn't get any jail time, but he was fined $2,100. I think the first taste of what would come later was the hacking that he did as a young programmer. And that really sort of foreshadowed a healthy skepticism of the use and abuse of technology by government. That's Vernon Silver. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg's investigations team. Assange's youth as a hacker laid the foundation for him to start WikiLeaks in 2006. But what is WikiLeaks? It's a website that posts unfiltered, usually classified documents. What separates it from every other media outlet is that they have no editorial hierarchy. With a publication like the New York Times, information comes in, they take that information, package it, then disseminate it for the public to see. WikiLeaks, however, cuts out the middleman. WikiLeaks gathers information, most of it given to them anonymously. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010, then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid, graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with pu publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats could face real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country including the United States, must be able to have candid conversations about the people and nations with whom they deal. Shortly after Cablegate, the Swedish government issued an arrest warrant for Assange on allegations of rape and molestation. He claimed the allegations were fabricated to get him extradited to the United States, a claim the U.S. government denied. Either way, Assange's next move was to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, which really was the beginning of the new chapter in his life and what we're dealing with now, which is him being stuck in London. What was supposed to be an office in an embassy is now Assange's self-imposed prison to this very day. But that doesn't mean he's slowed down. Since being trapped in the embassy, WikiLeaks has released files about Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Syrian political figures, and the draft to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then came the 2016 U.S. election. 
Thousands of leaked emails show Democratic Party officials possibly plotting against Bernie Sanders in his race against Hillary Clinton. Over the course of 68 days, WikiLeaks released 20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all friends. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not the state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks and still releasing documents. In March 2017, he started publishing documents from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence called Vault 7. The CIA, the agency charged with finding and keeping our top secrets, can't keep its own secrets. As long as Assange has a connection to the world, no government secret will be too far from exposure. Julian Assange is still in the embassy. Maybe he'll leave, maybe he won't. Kind of regardless, his work has been done. He's changed the way people think about their governments, about their own secrets, about their own hackability, and really the world has changed because of him. This entire video is based on a true story. 
when I do like motivational speeches or even tell myself like, love yourself and you should love yourself. This is Lily Singh. But to fans all over the world, she's the YouTube star, Superwoman. What up, everyone? It's girl, Superwoman. I know we can change the world for the better one positive day at a time. My parents now know what I do. <laughs> they didn't know what I did for a long time in the beginning of my career. I was just making videos in my room. They had no idea. Mom, Dad, have you seen my keys? I can't find them anywhere. Because you're always on phone. Until someone called them, like a family member from another part of Canada, was like, Canada, is your daughter making videos? And the mom was like, I don't, I don't know, Lily, or Lily, are you making videos? <laughs> Just making videos grew into an entire career. Today, Lily's YouTube channel has some 12 million subscribers, over 2 billion views, and guest stars like Michelle Obama, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Seth Rogen. I think a lot of young girls are raised to believe that you're going to go to school and then graduate and then get married and then get a job and have kids. And Lily was on that path, all the way through a psychology degree at York University in Toronto. But when she started thinking about a career... I started to immensely panic and think something was wrong with me because I tried to figure out my life and it wasn't working in that straight line. It was 2010 and YouTube was only five years old. I thought nothing of YouTube. I, I was probably the last person in my circle of friends to discover YouTube. And I remember when I did, I thought, this is so strange. There's people making videos in their rooms and other people are watching them. So she figured, why not give it a shot? I one day posted a video because I was sad and I wanted to be creative and happy. She didn't know how to edit video or write scripts, so she winged it. It was so bad and so cringe, and my expectation was literally nothing. I was like, I'm gonna put this video up, a couple of my friends are gonna watch it, probably make fun of me, and that's gonna be the end of this. The second and third video came from, wait, 70 people watched my first one, can I get 80 to watch the next one? She kept creating, she kept posting, and the viewers kept coming. Lily had found an audience. A lot of the comments were, oh my God, there's a brown girl on YouTube. More specifically, Indian. Lily's parents immigrated to Canada from India, and Lily was born and raised in Scarborough near Toronto. My home life was awesome. My parents, even though I portrayed them to be quite strict in my videos. Oh, Lily, when the rest of your scarred, huh? I teach you like this, to walk around like this, showing everything to everyone. They actually aren't like that at all. They're pretty modern and pretty cool. Your dress is short. Don't know what's for. And we're pretty lenient with me. I mean, I got to, I got away with a lot of things. I was a brat. This is this is. The, I was a brat. She had a different idea of what she wanted out of life than other kids. In a grade school graduation slideshow, her classmates said they wanted to be lawyers and doctors. And then I came up and I was like rapper. Looking out with your friends, man. But then you say that you hate home. I could just feel my parents being like, why? Because that's just not something women really did in the Singh family. I know there was a ton of people that weren't happy about my birth being a female, so I think, and that's some real-ish, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. The best thing I could have done to prove to so many people that didn't want my mom to have a daughter was to become Superwoman. What up, everyone? It's your girl, Superwoman. It was the name of Lily's favorite hip-hop song by Lil Mo featuring Fabulous. I love the song so much because it was one of the only songs of the time that was an empowering female song where Lil Mo's going on about, like, I will save guys with my superpowers and I will save girls with my superpowers and I am the superwoman. I thought, this name that I've had for so long that empowered me when I was younger, I'm going to make this my screen name. Maybe this should be a new series. Superwoman didn't just burst onto the scene overnight with a viral video. It was a steady climb fueled by hard work. The moment that I thought this is going somewhere and this could be a career was the first time I performed internationally. It was in India. And it was the first time where I was truly across the world and people knew my videos. Singh has transformed herself from a bratty kid to an internet personality to a media mogul. She starred in a feature film, A Trip to Unicorn Island, in 2016. And her book, How to Be a Boss, hit the New York Times bestseller list in 2017 while she was on a 30-city international tour. Lily started out with the goal of getting millions of subscribers and financial security. Hurry the hell up! But after surpassing those goals, success has new meaning. I've really come to terms with the fact that my, my definition of success is what's the best legacy I can leave behind. And it's not the number of views, the number of subscribers. It is the number of people that can say, this girl changed my life or changed something in my life positively.
is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. And you'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't see in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision-making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40%. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CT in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress, but reducing some of that work into actual tests in the laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if, whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
Wine is a $300 billion global industry where one person's opinion can make fortunes or break them. That's because of this man, Robert Parker, and his newsletter, The Wine Advocate. For three decades, he dominated as the world's most influential wine critic. Now Parker's protege is building an empire of his own. Antonio Galloni runs Venice. Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, at Venice, we started with the idea uh, in 2013 of building a world-class platform. We have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have 7 million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences, and I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different, and I have no, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is completely <laughs> anathemic to what Bob did with his company. Um, I want our writers to be partners. All of my senior people are locked into the company. They all have equity or they have a path to equity based on business results. That's something that we never had at Parker. Our, our benefits are world class uh, and everything that we've done at Venice is completely different from that model. When Steve Tanzer, who is the most experienced active wine critic in America, wants to work with us, that says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate, wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. You make it sound like The Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me, and we talked on the phone all the time, and he gave me great advice. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way his did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, the, it's not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did. Because they will, they will again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along. You know, it was like tennis, Pete Sampras. Nobody's ever going to win as many grandsons. I have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a... Uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky. People of my generation who are a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world-class company that would attract the best in class talent, and not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office, and at every level, what we're trying to, we only hire superstars, and we're looking for those superstars.
the world of professional wrestling, there's something called a swerve. Hulk Hogan has betrayed WCW! Some examples. These tag team partners are called baby faces, or the good guys. Then one of them swerves when he super kicks his tag team partner in the head, quickly assuming the role of the bad guy, or what the wrestling world calls the heel. Are you kidding? What a despicable act that was! Where a match is almost lost when, what's that? The superstar wrestler appears out of nowhere sprinting down the aisle to save the match. It's the Warriors music! It's the ultimate warrior! That's a swerve. So it should go as no surprise that World Wrestling Entertainment, known as the WWE, the most popular brand of sports entertainment in the world, is prepared for any swerves that come their way. So here's the story of how the WWE learned to see the swerve coming. So I spoke to Bloomberg reporters Felix Gillette. I'm a writer for Bloomberg News for the Global Business Team. And Kim Basin. And I'm the U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg. To find out exactly how the WWE is positioning itself for an all-out global invasion, which starts with a massive change to their lucrative pay-per-view model. WWE basically pioneered the pay-per-view model on cable. I remember as a kid, when the pay-per-view events came up, All of our friends would scramble around and try and get one of the parents to to pay for it. But in 2014, they took a huge risk. They saw a little bit sooner than some of the other entertainment brands that where this whole thing was moving was away from cable and satellite television and towards on-demand streaming video apps. They made this risky decision, in essence, cannibalizing that pay-per-view model, which they had essentially built. And after some early turbulence, it's working. Roughly 1.5 million people are paying $9.99 a month for the WWE app, making it the fifth most popular streaming OTT service. This adapt-or-die approach is in the WWE's DNA. Over the past 30 years, the company always seems to think two steps ahead. In the early 90s, WWE was at its most threatened when Ted Turner took them on with WCW, which stands for World Championship Wrestling. And back then, the WCW was winning the ratings war. So in order to compete with them, WWE had changed its product from a family-friendly kind of cartoonish style to this really raw. That's why they called their show Raw. It was this raw style of of, of wrestling. With violent, outrageous, reality-inspired plot lines and aggressive personas. From a 16-foot ladder! And they won that fight against Ted Turner. And they bought WCW. The early 2000s ushered in an era of testosterone-driven programming aimed at the red-blooded American male. Bra and panties matches and people smash each other over their head with, with like barbed wire bats and things like that. Until 2015, when WWE fans started a hashtag, Give Divas a Chance. Since then, WWE has hired 40 more female wrestlers. And that growing cast of female characters was part of a much larger plan they started to try to appeal to a broader set of people. Let's attract more female fans. And after we've attracted more female fans, let's attract more international fans. They're broadening their base, and they're doing that in large part to make it more advertising-friendly. And not just friendly to advertisers. They're trying to build up their fan base in China. They're trying to build up their fan base in Europe. They, you know, already have a pretty good fan base in India. India is a place where they already have an established wrestling culture because of the gigantic Indian wrestler, the great Kali. But there's still a lot of work to do. While the WWE set a revenue record in 2017, only 30% of it is coming from an overseas audience. And there's one person whose responsibility is to grow that number. The buck eventually stops at Vince McMahon, no matter what's happening within WWE. Yeah, he's a very controlling guy, and it's a very, very, very tightly scripted company. And that goes all the way down the board to the big stars' entrance music. And their, their outfits and things like that. So with a CEO like McMahon always planning two moves ahead and an aggressive push into multiple international markets, a big issue is money. It's hard to do all those things simultaneously without committing a huge amount of capital to it. And that's where the WWE becomes an attractive company for buyers. Potentially, one thing that could happen with WWE is they could benefit by being acquired by a bigger technology or telecom company, an Amazon or Facebook. 
Facebook or a 21st Century Fox. So with a market cap of $2.8 billion, the advantage of owning 100% of their own content and a rapid consolidation spreading throughout the entertainment industry, it looks like the WWE is well positioned, even if there are swerves ahead. Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. Saving the seas. This week, the deep sea diver who stopped riding the ocean's obituary to find a solution. And Rick Sala tells us why the next 10 years matter most. And globalization needs to get greener. Shipping accounts for nearly an eighth of all transport emissions. How can the industry clean up its act? Plus, protecting coastlines comes at a huge environmental cost. But one Israeli startup found a way to keep the sea out and the animals in. From London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. After more than a decade of studying the ocean as an academic, Enric Sala realized he was writing the ocean's obituary. He quit his job and became a full-time conservationist. As an in-house explorer for National Geographic, he's clocked more than 5,000 open water dives. He's also founded Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to lobby countries to protect their oceans. To date, it has helped create marine reserves equivalent to half the size of Canada. I spoke to him about his mission and why it's so urgent. The state of the world's oceans is really bad. We have lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean. Sharks, groupers, cod, tuna. More than half of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. More than half of the ocean is affected by industrial fishing and global warming is killing coral reefs all around the world. The ocean is in a trajectory of decline. Can you just visualize for our viewers who never get to see the kind of things you are able to see, what an ocean and healthy ecosystem looks like versus one that's next to a bustling economic and industrialized area? Coral reefs in the United States, in the Florida Keys, are down to only 2% of what they used to be. Before, 80 to 90% of the bottom on a coral reef in the Caribbean was covered by live coral. Now, Florida Keys have only 2%. The average in the Caribbean is about 5% of the bottom covered by live coral. The rest is covered by slime and seaweed. And most of the fish you can see are this big. And it is very, very rare that if you jump into any place in the Caribbean at random, you see a shark. It's very, very rare. Now, let's go to Millennium Atoll, for example. An atoll that is uninhabited and fished south of the equator in the Central Pacific belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. 2009, we conducted the first, the first underwater expedition to this island. And I still remember the first time. Jumped over the side of the boat. And as soon as the bubbles cleared, I was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple of minutes, the sharks decided that we were boring and they went back to do their thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral. And it's full of fish and a sea turtle comes by. Now this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. 
his government that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean. But also, local communities have an important role to play because some of the most successful protected areas in the ocean are community-led and community-managed marine reserves. So when the fish come back, the divers come in. And that creates huge economic opportunities through ecotourism. These areas that are managed by communities are very successful because the communities have a vested interest in having as many fish as possible inside them so they can enjoy the benefits. What from the pandemic has changed your view when it comes to protection of the environment? Nature has given us a very strong signal of how fast it can recover if we just give it space. Everybody was fascinated by all these videos of the whales and the dolphins coming into marinas and mountain lions on the streets of Santiago in Chile, wild goats in the UK. Nature has this extraordinary ability to bounce back if we just give it space. This is why we need to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. How do healthy marine ecosystems help in the fight against climate change, though? Most people see it. the ocean as a victim of climate change, but the ocean can also be a solution because we know that the more life that is in the ocean, like big fish and big whales, the more these organisms help to make the ocean productive and absorb more CO2. The kelp forests, seagrass beds, all of these are important ecosystems in the ocean that are similar to the forests on the land that capture a lot of our carbon pollution. What are you most excited about in your field? We have 10 years to fix this problem. Global fisheries catch is going down, the stocks are collapsing. Business as usual means that by 2050, 90% of the coral reefs are gone, that most commercial fisheries have collapsed. That affects food security, that affects a migration of people. We have 10 years to get to peak greenhouse gas emissions and then go carbon neutral by 2050. And we have 10 years to protect at least 30% of the ocean so we can restore much of this health and productivity, not just for saving biodiversity, but also saving our life support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual-frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change in, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest megacities are located at the coast. And this number will double, in, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious, uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for, for human beings. Coming up from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change.
but how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your green in brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. 
one of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to need to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year, the world's largest agriculture commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. 
marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. In the coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement based concrete, e concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna, plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We are geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist, and therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months, and this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, E-Concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed, to create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in case of a coral, it will die, and then another coral will sit on it, and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. 
The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete though is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage to the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week, The Fed Decides, with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes' Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. And it is live from the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, streaming on YouTube. It is a Fed Wednesday, St. Patrick's Day, March 17, 2021. This is the second Fed meeting of 2021. And let's get to some of the headlines as they are crossing the Bloomberg terminal. The Fed keeping rates near zero. Median dot shows on hold, though through, whoops, I just lost the headline. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> through, okay. So uh, Fed forca forecast shows 2.2% core inflation in 21, 2% 2 in 2022, 2.1% in 2023. Going back to that headline, Fed keeps rates near zero. As expected, median dot plot, though, we're getting an update showing on hold, though, Tim, through 2023. So expected this very low monetary policy and outlook still for a few years. Yeah, seven of 18 federal, Fed officials see at least one 23 rate hike. That's according to the dot plot. Just got to say, I'm looking at market reaction. S&P, uh, all of the major equity averages, especially the S&P and the Dow. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I need to cancel Bitcoin order to buy Bitcoin at 55.175, it moved, moved far, far away from this order, okay? So if you placed an order, don't forget to cancel it, all right? Okay, order canceled. Stay safe. 
and yields back off, equities come off. Listen, investors are saying, I'm going to be seeking yield, and that probably means equities. And some other headlines that have been crossing just in the last minute, the Fed saying uh, that it expects employment, the unemployment rate, to uh, go to 4.5% in 2021, then back down to 3.5% by the end of 2023. So all about that recovery and timeline yes, there. Exactly. And the Fed certainly keeps an eye on the job market. All right. Also, keeping an eye on the equity markets is our own Charlie Pellet. Charlie, I talked about some of that equity reaction. We're definitely seeing it. Yeah, absolutely right, Carol Nasser. Major market reaction right to the numbers. We'll give you more color in just a moment as our coverage continues right here on Bloomberg. S&P now lower by three, down one-tenth of one percent, fluctuating between gains and losses as I speak. We've got the Dow surging 175 points, up five-tenths of one percent, while NASDAQ is down 74. That is a drop of five-tenths of one percent. Ten-year yield backing off to 1.64 percent. Gold up four-tenths of one percent right now, 1738 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down four-tenths of one percent, 64.55 a barrel. Treasury yields, though, have climbed to a more than one-year high. Growth stocks favored under the so-called reflation trade led U.S. equity declines amid concern. Fed officials could revise forecasts for when they see a liftoff from near-zero rates. Today, though, we've got the Fed standing pat. And again, recapping here, 10-year yield, 1.65 percent. S&P down two, a drop there of one-tenth of one percent. Our coverage continues right here on Bloomberg. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It is indeed. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Focus on the Fed brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. All right, now let's get to today's breaking economic Fed news. And for that, Kathleen Hayes, Global Economics and Policy Editor at Bloomberg News, with us in our New York City Bureau. Dave Wilson, Stocks Editor at Bloomberg News, on the remote access from New Jersey. Kathleen, I think heading into the studio, you said there's going to be some headlines. Well, there are, and there are some very important ones, Carol, but you got to look just a little bit deeper uh, to see. Seven eight of 18 Fed officials see at least one uh, 2023 rate hike now. A, a, a change in liftoff? No, it's not a majority yet, but uh, the, at the January, excuse me, the December meeting, because, you know, they changed the dot plots. Mm -hmm. Their summary of economic projections every three months, there were only five. So you see you're going to get a little more sense that more is saying, well, the economy is going to be stronger than we thought. Listen to this law. You really need more details now on, on the what they're doing with their forecast. Real GDP in December, they saw 4.2% for the year. They boosted that by a good amount. It's 6.5% on their radio screen now. In December, they thought the unemployment rate would fall to 5%. Remember, it was up around 14%. Now they think the unemployment rate will end the year at 4.5%, and next year at 39 Some people will say, hey, 39 sounds very much like full employment, the substantial further progress that the Fed is hoping to make. And you mentioned those uh, core PC inflation numbers. What's interesting, so important, in December, they thought that the 2021 number would be one8 now they see it at 2.2. So they really mm. have changed their outlook on the economy. This is all very important. But a couple more things, though, you've got to have on the radar screen, though, because there were some things that they they uh, have not done. They didn't increase their bond purchases. They want to see substantial further progress, as I just said. Um, they are not in increasing the rate, the interest on excess reserves, that ties into some questions about money markets and how they could be roiled by some buildups in reserves. But really, there there's a lot of signals. I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen the bond market actually uh, gain some ground. And now mm -hmm. uh, the 30 year is back even lower than it was the 10 year about where it started, because on the one hand, they didn't change anything. But at the same time, it looks to me like if anything's there, a, a Fed that sees higher inflation and stronger growth than they thought before, maybe they will will be on the road to uh, a sooner liftoff. Not yet, but that's the kind of question we're going to hear put in front of Jay Powell. Bottom line, Fed turning more hawkish or not really? I don't think they're hawkish okay. yet. I think so far they're just recognizing the progress in the economy because they say the virus is still the biggest issue and it's still out there. Hey, Dave Wilson, come on in here and give us the equity market reaction. What happened when these headlines came out? How are traders uh, responding to this news? Well, I mean, you saw the S&P 500 spike up to its highs of the day, so clearly it's going over well. And if you want to focus on one area of the market that's sort of tied into the decision, it's the home builders. They were up. They, they immediately moved to their highs of the day uh, after uh, the decision came out. You know, and especially noteworthy, you got Lennar 
with the biggest gain in the S&P 500 right now. It's up more than 11.5% on top of what's happening with Fed policy. You know, they came out and said they raised capital from Center Bridge Partners for a new single-family rental business, and they also plan a spinoff that will include uh, their technology investments. So there's a company story to accompany the bigger story of where rates may be headed here. Yeah, good point. Hey, two things I want to get to, and I know Kathleen uh, mentioned this as well. Fed's forecast showing PCE will rise to 2.4% this year before backing off to 2% in 2022, 2.1% in 2023, yet the median dollar still show no rate hike through 2023. And this sentence retained from the January policy statement, quote, from the Fed, the ongoing public health crisis continues to weigh on economic activity, employment, and inflation and poses considerable risks to the economic outlook. Listen, Kathleen, this mirrors what Tim and I hear from so many folks in the medical communities, the corporate communities, like until we get this vaccine and virus under control, all bets are off. But look how much the cases have come down. Look how much the virus has But receded. we plateaued too, and and well, that is in, troubling to a lot of folks in the medical definitely, community. Definitely, and I think and I think it's kind of glass half empty, glass half, glass half full. Because if you talk to anybody anecdotally, just oh yeah, I didn't couldn't qualify for a vaccine, but I went over to Dwayne Reed to the to the Walgreens, and they had a bunch of leftovers at the end of the day. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'm only 28, but they gave me the vaccination. I think what uh, people were very negative about this, what they called a slow start to a program we had never done, probably in about a hundred years. Uh, you know. Yeah. nationwide vaccinations, and now they seem to be gaining some steam. So I think that's the thing that's interesting here. Yes, it still depends. Yes, there's tons of question marks over what happens next, right? Because we know things can get worse just when you think they're getting better. But it seems to me this, Fed's been saying this for the last year. You want to think, know what monetary policy is going to do? Watch the virus. The quicker this gets mm-hmm. under control, the more businesses can reopen, the more people aren't afraid to go out and shop and spend money and fly and go to hotels, the quicker the economy will pick up. The longer that lingers, the longer it will take. But I see Carol in, and Tim in this um, in this particular policy statement in some of the other things they're announcing that uh, this is – this is asymmetric to me. They're seeing what the economy is doing. Some people are saying, hmm, maybe we will raise rates a little bit sooner. So watch the economy. If it gets a lot stronger, a lot faster, maybe we do get lift off sooner. If it doesn't, you know, maybe they really can't lift off until 2024. So Carol mentioned inflation. So I, I want to ask about that, Kathleen, because the, the median Fed forecast shows that core inflation right around or above its target in the next few years. One topic that we've heard so much of, of, from investors about is inflation. So what is the message that the Fed is sending investors about inflation and how it feels about inflation? Well, so far, just looking at the forecast again, uh, because the core PCE, as you know, um, is... 2.2% this year, but Jay Powell and others have, have made it clear, we see a temporary kind of spike up in inflation as we adjust year after, you know, one year hence to the, the numbers that fell so much last year. And so there's going to be a lot of things and then pent up demand after the after not being able to shop. But the, I think the fact that we see in the 2022 year 2%, 2023 2.1%, the question will be, Jay Powell says, and all, many of them have said, they don't mind seeing inflation at 2.5% even higher. They want it above 2% and staying there. Would, would 2% in, in 2022 convince right. them it's time to lift off? Probably not. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Kathleen Hayes, Global Economics and Policy Editor at Bloomberg News. Dave Wilson, Stocks Editor, will be back with his chart and stock of the day. All right, let's get to the Bloomberg Business Week Bite of the Day. The Bloomberg Business Week Bite of the Day is brought to you by GEP. GEP helps businesses transform supply chains with strategy, managed services, and AI-based cloud-native software. Learn more at GEP.com. Today's number, Tim, is 70,000. Uber, we talked about this yesterday. They're going to classify all 70,000 of its UK drivers as workers, entitling them to the minimum wage, vacation pay, and other benefits after a landmark ruling from the Supreme Court last month. So listen, these drivers Drivers are going to receive at least the national living wage of 8.72 pounds an hour. That works out to about $12.11 U.S., and that starts today. You and I have talked about Game Changer. Yeah, this is a Game Changer. Shares of Uber lower by 4.3%. Um, this was this announcement was made after the markets closed yesterday. I think investors are still reacting to this decision. Uh, this is a big deal because the fact of the matter is, is does it mean that Uber is going to reclassify its drivers in other parts of the world, right. in other countries, in other states? It was a big deal in California with Proposition 22 just a few months ago. This discussion is happening as more and more people become gig workers, and people think differently about the way that they are working and the benefits that are associated with them. 
got to say, when it comes to the gig economy and social media, we are watching in technology and privacy. We watch for what Europe's doing because it often sets the trends. All right, uh, watching that, but also watching world and national news. For that, over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. Authorities in Atlanta say a motive is still not clear, but it does not look as if the suspect in yesterday's killings at three area massage parlors was carrying out a hate crime on Asians, even though six of the eight people murdered were Asian women. Captain Jay Baker is with the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office. It sounds to me like these, these, these locations, he sees them as an outlet for him, that something that he shouldn't be doing, and that uh, an issue with porn, and that he was attempting to take out that temptation. The suspect is 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long. He has been charged with four counts of murder, one count of assault. Authorities say he was heading to Florida for more attacks when he was apprehended by authorities. The White House says President Biden is receiving an update on the shootings later today from Attorney General Merrick Garland and FBI Director Christopher Wray. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is addressing what he calls the unprecedented challenges at the U.S.-Mexico border. He's been testifying before the House Committee on Homeland Security. We have taken a series of actions to address the increase in the number of unaccompanied children at the border. We have increased our capacity to hold the children until HHS can shelter them while it identifies and vets the children's sponsors. The Orcus says the Trump administration left behind an inhumane and inadequate system. April 15th will not be tax day this year. The IRS is apparently pushing the tax deadline to mid-May, giving Americans more breathing room to pay their taxes and pay for outstanding levies. An exact date, though, has not yet been announced. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Now back to you, Carol and Tim. All right, Nancy, really appreciate that. Of course, our top story on this Fed Wednesday is the Federal Reserve, keeping zero uh, rates as expected. Uh, and in terms of the outlook, also going to keep rates pretty low for a while still. Season inflation bump as short lived in the future, so just giving us some indications of where they see things going. Let's get into it with our roundtable. Yeah, let's do it. Ali Wolf is chief economist at Zonda, joining us on the phone from Irvine, California. Jeffrey Cleveland is chief economist at Payton and Regal on the phone from Los Angeles. They're not too far apart right no. now. <laughs> Thanks to both of you for, for joining us. Um, Ali, I want to start with you, your immediate reaction to this news. So this is a fun day for the Fed followers. Uh, what we saw, obviously, a, a huge revision by the Fed, but this was to be expected. And it basically matches what we've been seeing from the private economists who have been putting out their forecast that GDP is going to be pretty remarkable this year as the economy opens up at a, at a way more rapid pace than I think a lot of us expected. Well, okay. So come on in on, good to know, um, Jeff, Jeffrey, come on in too in terms of your um, reaction to uh, the Fed decision. I was going to say, the distance between Irvine and Los Angeles <laughs> depends a lot on the traffic. So it, it can actually take a lot longer than you think, Tim. Um, yeah, I mean, the, big, the big thing here is they have a better economic outlook, uh, better GDP growth. They have lower unemployment. They have a little bit higher inflation. Yet the median dot, the median dot does not move for 2023. That is the key. The, uh, it's this kind of tug of war that's going on with the financial market, with the bond market in particular, where the bond market is saying, okay, better growth, higher inflation, therefore you need to hike. And the Fed is saying, no, 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 that is the, the script from perhaps last cycle. That is not the script we're, we're going to use. We're going to keep rates at zero for longer. And so that's the message they delivered here. Whether the market really believes it, Carol and Tim, that's, a, that's another question itself. Dare I say Goldilocks economy, so unemployment rate gets better, although let's not forget there, you know, these, there are so many different measures of un uh, unemployment. It doesn't really look at um, the millions who are out of the labor force altogether who've just said, I'm frustrated, I'm out of it. But dare I say, Jeffrey, that we are or could be headed for kind of a Goldilocks economy, some growth with low inflation once again. For investors, this is perfect. You have better growth, you have a little bit higher inflation, which is fine and you have an easy Fed. You could mix in there very easy fiscal conditions as well. So I think this is a very good backdrop for risk assets for, for investors overall. I would ignore the unemployment rate, Carol, that 4% mm. figure that gets bandied about. I would focus instead on the employment to population, mm -hmm. 25 to 54 year olds, how many of them or what percentage of those are folks are employed. That's at 76 right now. It needs to be over 80 before I even think we should have another phone call about full employment. So that's a ways to go. 
Hey, Ali, come on in here and talk about the reaction among home builders right now, because this is something that, that of course, you watch closely at, at, at Zonda. You heard Dave Wilson earlier talk about housing stocks on a tear uh, this afternoon. What's the reaction there? Yeah, so when you look at the housing market and you look at what's happened to the economy over the past year, you've basically had people that have been forced to save. Now, by the way, this doesn't just apply to the housing market. This applies to the wider economy. You have people that have been forced to save. There has been student loan forbearance. There has been three different rounds coming up of stimulus. And then you also have, which I think a lot of people forget, the underground economy, the hairdressers and the, the fitness instructors that were still working under the table and also getting unemployment insurance and also getting the stimulus. So when you start to add up all of those numbers, you really have people that were able to continue to work flush with cash. And when you look at the, the housing market, well, certainly that's a, a game changer because people need to save for a down payment to purchase a home. And all of a sudden, because of what happened to the economy, again, as long as you are employed, a lot of people are in a really healthy position that's going to drive growth not only for the home builders, but also for the wider economy. Let's remind everybody in just about 13 minutes, a little bit under 13 minutes time, we will take you to the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C., and to Fed Chief Jay Powell. His statement and his press conference will begin at that time, and of course we will cover it live right here at Bloomberg. Right now we're talking with Ali Wolf, Chief Economist at Zonda, Jeffrey Cleveland, Chief Economist at Payton and Regal. So, Ali, let me ask you, though, the housing recovery uh, and strength, how important is it, though, in terms of the upcoming economic recovery? And, I, and I'm, I'm asking, too, with an eye on, in some parts of the world, it does feel like, or in some parts of the country, that we're starting to see, you know, a shortage of supply. Yeah. So when we look at the housing starts numbers, or you look at how many homes are being built, for every single home that's built, three different jobs are created. And housing has been able to partly lead the recovery this time around because builders have been so active. And on the new and existing home side, for every home someone purchases, they spend money elsewhere. They spend money at Home Depot. They spend money at Target. And that helps those different companies along the way, too. The risk, though, is as we're looking at the 10-year Treasury, we know that that's closely linked to mortgage rates. Yes, mortgage rates are still historically low at 3%, but we just have to watch how high those go because really even... 10, 15 basis points starts to price people out of the market right. with how much home prices have gone up over the past year as well. Jeffrey, what do you make of, of how the Fed is, is thinking about 2021 growth? Uh, the Fed is even more optimistic on, on 2021 growth, as Chris Yancey points out in our, in our live blog right now. The median forecast among economists surveyed by Bloomberg, um, the Fed policymakers median is 6.5. The Bloomberg survey uh, medium is, median is 6. So the Fed clearly optimistic here. Yeah, I don't know what the Bloomberg uh, survey there is doing. I mean, I think uh, the Payton and Regal forecast for 2021 is 6.5%, so mm. it's right in line with the FOMC median. I like that. So I would, the way I would spin it, Tim, is that uh, the Fed has finally caught up with Payton and Regal's uh, more upbeat <laughs> uh, economic forecast, which actually probably should maybe be a little concerned at this point. I don't know. Why? <laughs> Talk, yeah, talk. I mean, I mean, I mean obviously, it's, you're joking there, but but like, wh why why were you guys why are you guys so optimistic? I mean, wh and well, why? Did, yeah, go ahead. The, the the optimistic tone, sorry, to start the year was due to just the reopening, the fact that households do have a lot of pent up savings, depending on how you measure it, somewhere between one and two trillion, you know, or ten percent of GDP roughly. So that's a huge amount of money that will be, I think, unleashed as as the economy reopens. And then now another round of uh, fiscal relief coming down. So, you know, all those things together, I think you can very easily get to a 6 6.5% GDP growth figure, maybe even some risk, Tim, to higher growth in, in 2021. That being said, the thing is, looking at a little bit further, I think we'll settle back down somewhere closer to 2% to or so. So it's not something that will persist beyond, beyond 2021. But I think it's a very upbeat view for the year ahead. So, Ali, you know, I asked Jeffrey about, you know, a Goldilocks economy. Uh, you know, it took a while to kind of get things going coming off of the financial crisis, but we did kind of have, you know, low and steady for a long, long time. Uh, so, certainly something that financial market investors uh, made them, you know, pretty, you know, eager to take on risk uh, in a low yield environment. How do you see it? Could we be setting up for once again kind of a low and steady recovery here? Well, I actually think it's going to be really robust. When you look at history, so we've now put $6 trillion into the system over the past year from just 
the uh, Congress and from what they've done from the different stimulus packages versus $1.8 trillion over multiple years last time around. And when a lot of us economists look at the data, we say, well, that's one of the reasons that it was so long and protracted to finally get back. But what we've seen from the stimulus checks that have gone out so far, we can already learn from what consumers do with it. And so right now, this is data from the Chicago Fed, you can see 50% of the money gets spent basically right away, and then 50% of it gets saved. And some of that money is getting saved for things people can't do today, but they can do three or four months from now. Right. Go on vacation, go to restaurants, go to bars. And so that's why I also feel really positive. I think I mean, we've seen Goldman's forecast are even higher than that 6.5% that we're seeing from the Fed, but that's what gives me support about the economic recovery. But it's a spike, Allie, right? And then we start to settle down to kind of more normal levels. It is, but it depends. It depends on is it that one-time vacation that you're going on? I know a lot of people are talking about they want to either take multiple vacations. I want to take, take 10 vacations right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I understand that, but we also know that there's additional stimulus that's likely going to come on the infrastructure side, which fuels more longer-term uh, uh, growth, too. So, Jeffrey, the, the Fed is optimistic, paid in, and Regal is optimistic. How quickly, in, in your opinion, does hiring start to pick up just in the next few months? I think we could have uh, three, four months ahead, Tim, where you have a million, a million and a half jobs added each and every month. So it, it can come back very, very quickly, I think. I, that, to me, that's the lesson of the last nine months, not just for the Fed, but also for forecasters. People were very, and I think it's justifiable last summer to be very pessimistic given the state of, of the world at the time. But things have changed dramatically, especially in the last six or eight weeks even. So we, we've seen that uh, as soon as things reopen, uh, hiring will come back very, very quickly. We got a little taste of that last year, but I think that's what's ahead for the next, I would say, three, three to four months. Hey, uh, Ali and Jeffrey, I want to ask you, is this kind of how we, fingers crossed, had hoped it would, would play out after the deep decline and the economy shut down, uh, shutting down last year? You know, Ali, isn't this kind of, I know it's a lot of money being pumped into the system, but isn't this kind of what we hoped for rather than staying down for a longer time, which would have made it more difficult to bounce back? I think this is what we hoped for, but I would say at least my early forecast was more like a swoosh shape. I thought that there would be a little bit of economic pain. And I do want to temper what I just said with some of the labor statistics, because if you do look at the leisure and hospitality sector, so that's obviously the sector that's been hit the hardest. Let's say tomorrow, because the economy opens up, every single one of those jobs comes back. Right. We go from 9.5 million jobs shy of where we, where we were last year to now 5 million jobs shy of where we are last year. So there's a lot of enthusiasm that, okay, as we open up, and I, I just said it to you guys too, there's a lot of enthusiasm on that front, but we still have some lingering pain with the long-term unemployed, with the commercial real estate space that I think, honestly, not enough people are, are acknowledging that there's a risk on that front too. Tim and I talk about that all the time. Like we just, driving around New York, it's just staggering the number of boarded up, shut down, you know, retail, restaurants, you name it, that are no longer there, Tim. Yeah, and if companies have, and employees have proven, look, to, mm -hmm. you know, mixed reviews from executives who we hear from pretty much each and every week about how they feel about employees not being in the office. But if employees have proven that they can work in a hybrid environment or, or remotely from home or coming into the office just a couple of days a week, that has serious repercussions for parts of the economy. So, Jeffrey, commercial real estate, is that something that might be another shoe to drop maybe this year or into next year? Well, I have to say, I think if you go back nine months ago, the, the outlook was much more pessimistic. Like, we would never return to the office. I think that's changed a lot, and I think you see that change in, in pricing for for the, the commercial real estate sector in, in various ways. So maybe we should be a little bit more upbeat. Um, it was like, Carol, it was the U, the L, the <laughs> W shape recovery. It's much more like the U than I think, uh, or even like the V. You know, it's not the L or it's not the W. Um, but that being said, I mean, I think there is some restructuring that needs to go on here. But that's, that's something that happens every recession, where you do have sectors that don't quite come back to where they were pre-recession and the capital needs to be reallocated. So maybe uh, that that will be focused on the, on the CRE space. Well, Jeffrey, one letter you didn't mention was K, and it's the K-shaped recovery that, that we've been talking about for months, that the people who have been at the, the higher end of the, the income bracket uh, have done so much better than those at the lower end. Uh, what needs to happen in order for the recovery to be equal? The best thing that can happen for the K-shaped type recovery to get the lower end back is to have full and inclusive employment. So 
That's why I was so emphatic mm-hmm. about the, the 25 to 54 year old and the population. It's at 76. We need it back at 80. When that labor market gets to that level of tightness, that's when the lower income stretches. I think maybe the Fed even learned its lesson that perhaps they preemptively hiked uh, too much too quickly and sort of uh, we could have had an even hotter labor market. So we need a hot labor market to help the bottom part of the case. Is right, the answer. which is just where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, just three and a half minutes away from Jay Powell of the Federal Reserve, he will be making a brief statement followed by, of course, the press conference following that latest Fed decision. We're with here uh, with Ali Wolf of Zonda and Jeffrey Cleveland of Payton and Regal. Guys, um, got a question for you both. Uh, what keeps you up at night, Ali? What worries you about the U.S. economy right now? So I would say, and this is something that I'm sure people will ask Jay Powell on when he comes out for his press conference, is he has acknowledged that, yes, we're going to have this the base effect with inflation, and yes, we're going to have um, transitory inflation. But the question, basically everyone is saying we haven't seen inflation in the past, and going into this, we didn't see really high levels of inflation, so we shouldn't expect to see it. And I know there's a couple different camps emerging, but we're living through a world of so many different unprecedented. You know, we're talking about a top dollar amount that we haven't seen. We're talking about that gap between the haves and the have-nots. We're talking about the savings changes. We're talking about a goods economy that's thriving and a service economy that's not. And and eventually they both will maybe come up and they'll meet in the middle. But how high can inflation go? How long can the Fed hold off? If the numbers are alarmingly higher than what they think, which I think at one phase uh, throughout this year, we may see pretty alarmingly high inflation numbers. Jeffrey, same question to you. What keeps you up at night? I think policymakers are always fighting the last battle. And the, the battle last cycle, the lesson that policymakers seem to have learned is that they could have let the economy run a bit hotter or longer and not preemptively uh, started the hiking cycle. And that would have benefited a lot of the, the labor market, and that maybe would have had higher inflation. So they, they seem to think that it was their, you know, their call. They control inflation. I wonder about that. What, what if that's the wrong lesson and inflation, you know, has a mind of its own, is driven by something else, and it, it, they'll be a bit surprised here by a, by a more persistent pickup. That's probably the biggest concern. All right, going to leave it on that note. Guys, you were amazing. Thank you so much. Really smart insight. Ali Wolf, chief economist at Zonda, on the phone from Irvine, California, just around the corner. Jeffrey, Lee, Jeffrey Cleveland, he's chief economist at Payton and Regal, on the phone from Los Angeles. Uh, optimism. I mean, listen, this is an interesting report. Uh, here's the headline. Federal Reserve officials continuing to project near zero interest rates at least through 2023 while upgrading their economic outlook to reflect greater optimism over the U.S. recovery from COVID-19 amid a surge in Treasury yield. So that's kind of a sweet <laughs> remarks uh, from the Federal Reserve. That said, that said, the pandemic continues to pose considerable risks to mm-hmm. outlook. Things could, and that's the signal that the Fed is sending. Uh, the Fed also repeating to maintain buys until substantial further progress. Fed holding pace, composition monthly asset purchases at $120 billion. And I do want to point out in something Kathleen highlighted and some of our other guests, seven of 18 officials predicted higher rates by the end of 2023 compared with five of 17 at the December meeting meeting showing a slightly larger group who see an earlier start than peers to the withdrawal of ultra-easy monetary policy, something we've gotten used to a lot. Right now, that 10-year yield with uh, a yield of 1.66, five-year note yielding 0.80, and the shorter end of the yield curve, two-year note specifically with a yield of 0.13. We do want to take you to the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. We are expecting that live press conference with Jay Powell. Of course, he will make a short statement, and it will be followed by questions from members of the press. Let's take you to D.C. and Jay Powell. The pandemic arrived with force on our shores. Looking back, it was clear that addressing a fast-moving global pandemic would be plainly and primarily the realm of health care providers and experts. And we are grateful to them and to all the essential workers for their service and sacrifice. The danger to the U.S. economy was also clear. Congress provided by far the fastest and largest response to any post-war economic downturn, offering fiscal support for households, businesses, health care providers, and state and local governments. Here at the Federal Reserve, we rapidly deployed our full range of tools to provide relief and stability, to ensure that the recovery will be as strong as possible, and to limit lasting damage to the economy. We are strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. 
The economic fallout has been real and widespread. But with the benefit of perspective, we can say that some of the very worst economic outcomes have been avoided by swift and forceful action from Congress, from across government, and in cities and towns across the country. More people held on to their jobs, more businesses kept their doors open, and more incomes were saved as a result of these swift and forceful policy actions. And while we welcome these positive developments, no one should be complacent. At the Fed, we will continue to provide the economy the support that it needs for as long as it takes. <clears throat> Today, the FOMC kept interest rates near zero and maintained our sizable asset purchases. These measures, along with our strong guidance on interest rates and on our balance sheet, will ensure that monetary policy will continue to deliver powerful support to the economy until the recovery is complete. The path of the economy continues to depend significantly on the course of the virus and the measures undertaken to control its spread. Since January, the number of new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths has fallen, and ongoing vaccinations offer hope for a return to more normal conditions later this year. In the meantime, continued observance of social distancing measures and wearing masks will help us reach that goal as soon as possible. The economic recovery remains uneven and far from complete, and the path ahead remains uncertain. Following the moderation in the pace of the recovery that began toward the end of last year, indicators of economic activity and employment have turned up recently. Although the sectors of the economy most adversely affected by the resurgence of the virus and by greater social distancing remain weak, household spending on goods has risen notably so far this year. In contrast, household spending on services remains low, especially in services that typically require people to gather closely, including travel and hospitality. The housing sector has more than fully recovered from the downturn, while business investment and manufacturing production have also picked up. The overall recovery in economic activity since last spring is due, importantly, to unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy actions, which have provided essential support to households, businesses, and communities. The recovery has progressed more quickly than generally expected, and forecasts from FOMC participants for economic growth this year have been revised up notably since our December Summary of Economic Projections. In commenting on the stronger outlook, participants noted progress on vaccinations as well as recent fiscal policy. As with overall economic activity, conditions in the labor market have turned up recently. Employment rose by 379,000 in February as the leisure and hospitality sector recouped about two-thirds of the jobs that were lost in December and January. <clears throat> Nonetheless, employment in this sector is more than 3 million below its level at the onset of the pandemic. For the economy as a whole, employment is 9.5 million below its pre-pandemic level. The unemployment rate remains elevated at 6.2 percent in February. This figure understates the shortfall in employment, particularly as participation in the labor market remains notably below pre-pandemic levels. Looking ahead, FOMC participants project the unemployment rate to continue to decline. The median projection is 4.5 percent at the end of this year and moves down to 3.5 percent by the end of 2023. The economic downturn has not fallen equally on all Americans, and those least able to shoulder the burden have been the hardest hit. In particular, the high level of joblessness has been especially severe for lower-wage workers in the service sector and for African Americans and Hispanics. The economic dislocation has upended many lives and created great uncertainty about the future. Overall inflation remains below our 2 percent longer-run objective. Over the next few months, 12-month measures of inflation will move up as the very low readings from March and April of last year fall out of the calculation. Beyond these base effects, we could also see upward pressure on prices if spending rebounds quickly as the economy continues to reopen, particularly if supply belt bottlenecks limit how quickly production can respond in the near term. However, these one-time increases in prices are likely to have only transient effects on inflation. The median inflation projection of FOMC participants is 2.4 percent this year and declines to 2 percent next year before moving back up by the end of 2023. The Fed's response to this crisis has been guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people, 
along with our responsibilities to promote the, financial, the stability of the financial system. As we say in our statement on longer-run goals and monetary policy strategy, we view maximum employment as a broad-based and inclusive goal. Our ability to achieve maximum employment in the years ahead depends importantly on having longer-term inflation expectations well anchored at 2%. As the committee reiterated in today's policy statement, with inflation running persistently below 2%, we will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time so that inflation averages 2% over time and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. We expect to maintain an accommodative stance of monetary policy until these employment and inflation outcomes are achieved. With regard to interest rates, we continue to expect it will be appropriate to maintain the current 0 to 1 quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate until labor market conditions have reached levels consistent with the committee's assessment of maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2 percent and is on track to moderately exceed 2 percent for some time. I would note that a transitory rise in inflation above 2 percent, as seems likely to occur this year, would not meet this standard. In addition, we will continue to increase our holdings of Treasury securities by at least $80 billion per month and of agency mortgage-backed securities by at least $40 billion per month until substantial further progress has been made toward our maximum employment and price stability goals. The increase in our balance sheet since last March has materially eased financial conditions and is providing substantial support to the economy. The economy is a long way from our employment and inflation goals, and it is likely to take some time for substantial further progress to be achieved. Our forward guidance for the federal funds rate, along with our balance sheet guidance, will ensure that the stance of monetary policy remains highly accommodative as the recovery progresses. Our guidance is outcome-based and ties the path of the federal funds rate and the balance sheet to progress toward reaching our employment and inflation goals. Overall, our interest rate and balance sheet tools are providing powerful support to the economy and will continue to do so. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We are committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy and to help assure that the recovery from this difficult period will be as robust as possible. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. from Reuters. Uh, hi, Chair Powell, and, and thanks for that. So um, could you talk us through how the um, the forecasts for 2021 map into the substantial further progress definition, uh, you know, 2.4% inflation? I understand that's considered transitory. That still seems like some progress there, 4.5% unemployment. Uh, is it time to start talking about talking about uh, tapering yet? <laughs> Not yet. Um, so, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, we've said that we would um, continue asset purchases at this pace uh, until we see substantial further progress. And that's actual progress, not forecast progress. So, and that's a difference from, from our past approach. So, and what we mean by that is, is pretty straightforward. It is we'll want to see that, uh, that the labor markets have moved, labor market conditions have moved, you know, have made substantial progress toward maximum employment, and inflation has made substantial progress toward uh, the 2% goal. That's what we're going to want to see. Now, that obviously includes an element of judgment. And when we see, we'll be, we'll be carefully looking ahead. We, we, we also understand that we, we will uh, want to provide as much advance notice of any potential taper as possible. So when we see that we're on track, when we see actual data coming in that suggests that we're on track, to perhaps achieve substantial further progress, then we'll say so. And we'll say so well in advance of any decision to actually taper. If I could follow up on that, the shift in the dots, why wouldn't that suggest a weakening of the commitment here? An awful lot of people shifted into 2022, it seems. Yeah, I, I, I don't see that at all. You know, we, we have a, a range of perspectives uh, on the committee. I welcome that. and. Uh, uh, you know, we 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 have we debate things, we discuss things, and we always come together around a around a, a solution. But uh, you know, the, the the strong bulk of the committee 
uh, is uh, is not showing a rate increase uh, during this forecast period. And uh, you know, as as data improve, as the outlook improves very significantly since the December meeting, you would expect forecasts to move up. It's probably not a surprise that some people would bring in their estimate of the appropriate time for liftoff. Nonetheless, uh, you know, the bulk of the committee, this, the, the the largest part by far of the committee, is is um, doesn't show a rate increase during this period. And again, part of that is wanting to see actual data. Uh, rather than just a forecast at this point. We do expect that um, we'll begin to make faster progress on uh, both spending and, you know, labor markets and inflation as the year goes on because of the progress with the vaccines, because of uh, the fiscal support that we're getting. We expect that to happen, but, you know, we'll have to see it first. Great. Thank you. Victoria. Um, hi, Chair Powell. I wanted to ask about the supplementary leverage ratio. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what you all are going to do this month, um, which I'm happy to hear an update if you have one. But uh, just sort of more broadly, do you think long term that the leverage ratio poses problems for um, implementing monetary policy at a time when the reserve supply is going to remain large? And um, if so, do you think the changes to the leverage ratio, including the SLR, are the way to deal with that problem? Victoria, um, we'll have something to announce on that in coming days, and uh, I'm not going to expound upon your questions. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you ask another question if you'd like to, because, because that one I'm just going to say that we're going to something in coming days. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, well, then I'll ask about um, unemployment. You know, there's um, the unemployment rate is uh, you all have projections for the U6 rate, but you've also been, you know, really uh, emphasizing the fact that that's not the only thing that you all are looking at. You're also looking at labor force participation and things like that. So are you all looking at ways of maybe uh, adding to how you're projecting the unemployment rate to the summary of economic projections? Well, let me say... As we say in our um, statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, we look to a range of indicators on labor market. We, we never only looked at, at uh, the unemployment rate, which is the only uh, indicator of, of labor market outcomes that's in the SEP. Uh, we look at a very broad range. You hear us talk all the time about participation, about employment to population, which is the combination of the two, about different measures of, of, of unemployment. So. It's wages. It's uh, it's the job flows. It's you know all of those things are they go into an assessment disparities of various groups. All that goes into an assessment of maximum employment. The the trying to incorporate all of that into the summary of economic projections would not be practical. Uh, you know obviously the thing that we do include is just the unemployment rate, and that's a very insufficient statistic. Uh, so it, it doesn't include a lot of other things. That we that we do look at, and um, I, I wouldn't want to say that we're looking to include the other dozen things that we look at into the SEP, but uh, at time from time to time we do look at at, at adding different things. But uh, I, I would just say the SEP is a it's a summary. It's one device. It's not going to include all of the things that we look at. I think you know the things that we look at. We we talk about them all the time. Um, so we're not actually looking actively at significantly broadening those indicators in the SEP right now. Thank you. Chris Rubieber, Associated Press. Uh, thank you. Um, Chair Powell, I wanted to ask about the forecast overall. You're forecasting uh, a very low unemployment rate next year and in 2023. Uh, you have inflation or the Fed overall is in the SEP forecasting inflation at or above 2% uh, by 2023, uh, yet no rate hike in any of this, in any of this uh, forecast horizon. So is this telling us that you see a higher inflation rate than what's projected, uh, or do you not, as you've been talking about, is the unemployment rate insufficient, or what is this telling us about the Fed's reaction function that uh, it seems you're meeting the Fed's dual mandate by 2023, yet again, no rate hike expected. So I guess the first thing to say is that the, the SEP is not a committee forecast. It's, it's not something we sit around and debate and discuss and approve and say this represents our, you know, our uh, reaction function as a committee. It, it's a compilation of projections from 
different people. And I, it, it would, since we don't debate it or discuss it, it would be hard for me to say why exactly why each participant uh, did what they were going to do. So the, uh, all I would say about this is that um, we've we laid out I th what I think is very clear guidance on liftoff. And it's really three things, labor market conditions that are consistent with our estimates of maximum employment. And as I mentioned, we consider a wide range of indicators in assessing labor market conditions, not just the unemployment rate. Inflation that has reached 2% and not just on a transitory basis. And inflation that's on track to run moderately above 2% for some time. The first two of those three are very much database. The third does have a, a little bit of, a, of a, an element of uh, expectations in it. So we are very much determined to implement this guidance in a robust way. It is the guidance that we chose carefully to implement our new framework. Um, and to meet these standards, uh, we'll need to see data, as I mentioned. Um, so what, this, what, what does this, this SEP really say? It says that we're committed to our framework and to the guidance we've provided to implement that framework. We will wait. Uh, until the requirements set forth in that guidance are clearly met before considering a change in our policy rate. And the last thing I'll say is this. Um, the state of the economy in two or three years is highly uncertain, and I wouldn't want to focus too much on the exact timing of a potential rate increase that far into the future. Uh, so that's how I would think about the, the SEP. Thank you. Paul Kiernan. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, my question is twofold. Uh, one, um, how high are you comfortable letting inflation rise? There, there is some ambiguity in, in, in your new target, as you mentioned, um, expectations driven. Um, and, and do you think that that ambiguity might cause markets to price in a lower tolerance for inflation than the Fed actually has, thereby causing financial conditions to tighten prematurely? Is, is that a concern? Thanks. So we've said we'd like to see inflation run moderately above 2% for some time. And we've resisted, basically, generally, the uh, temptation to try to quantify that. Part of that just is talking about inflation is one thing. Actually having inflation run above 2% is the real thing. So I... Uh, uh, we've, you know, over the years, we've we've talked about two percent inflation as a goal, but we haven't achieved it. So I, I would say we'd like to, you know, perform. Uh, that's what we'd really like to do is to get inflation moderately above two percent. I don't want to be too specific about what that means because I, I think it's hard to do that, and we haven't done it yet. You know, when we're actually above two percent, we can do that. I um, I, look, I I would say this we. Are, the fundamental change in, in our framework is uh, that we, we're not going to act preemptively based on forecasts for the most part. Um, and we're going to wait to see actual data. And I think it will take people time to, to adjust to that and to adjust to that new practice. And the only way we can really build the credibility of that is by doing it. So uh, that's how I would think about that. Thank you. Matthew Bosler. Hi, Chair Powell. This is Matthew Boser with Bloomberg News. So there's a widespread presumption at this point that the U.S. will reach herd immunity sometime this year. Um, and all along, you've said that the path of the economy is going to be determined by the course of the virus. Um, I'm curious, based on the projections that you released today that show unemployment will still be above estimates of maximum employment through the end of next year and perhaps sometime into 2023, uh, do you think policymakers need to be doing more here to sort of align the um, herd immunity and full employment timelines, if you will? Thank you. So on, on herd immunity, I, I'm really going to leave that question to the experts. Um, we don't control that. We're not responsible for defining it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll leave that whole discussion to the experts. I mean, we're what we're focused on is... Um, is the part that we control, which is the support that we provide to the economy. And there we've provided very clear guidance. Uh, and in the case of asset purchases, it's uh, uh, at their current level until we make substantial further progress. There is an element of judgment in that, and we'll, we'll therefore we'll supply clear communication well in advance 
of, of actually tapering. And we just went through the, you know, the, the criteria for raising interest rates. They're very specific. And, um, you know, we're, we're very much committed to having them fulfilled robustly. I, I would agree with you that the, the path of the virus continues to be very important. We, we have these, um, you know, new strains with her, which, which can be very, quite virulent, uh, and we're not actually done yet. And I, I, um, we're, we're, we're clearly on a good path with, with uh, cases coming down, as I mentioned, but we're not done, and I'd hate to see us take our, our eye off the ball before we actually finish the job. Uh, so that's how I would look at that. If I could just briefly follow up, um, how do you see sort of the disconnect in terms of uh, an economy that is expected to be widely reopened this year, but uh, full employment taking uh, longer to achieve? Is it is it the case that um, you know, factors related to the virus will still be with us um, over the coming years? Is that how to interpret the forecast? I think there's some of that. Sure, sure there'll be some of that. There'll still be some social distancing. People may be for example, going into um, uh, spaces that that uh, uh, you know that involve close contact with others, some people will do that right away. Others will hold back, and so I think there'll there'll be some of that. In addition, though, remember there there are 10 million people in the range of 10 million people who need to get back to work, and it's going to take some time for that to happen. You know, it can it can happen maybe maybe more quickly than it has in the past because. It involves the reopening of a sector of the economy as opposed to stimulating aggregate demand and waiting for that to produce job demand for workers. This could be a different sort of a process, and it could be quicker. We don't know that. Um, but it's, it's just a lot of people who, have, who need to get back to work, and it's not going to happen overnight. It would be, it's going to take some time, no matter how uh, well the economy performs. Le unemployment will take a, a, a quite a time to go, to go down, and so will participation. So uh, that's all I can say. I think it, it, the faster the better. We'd love to see it come sooner rather than later. We'd welcome nothing more than that. But realistically, given the numbers, it's going to take some time. Thank you. Steve Leisman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, kind of a three-parter here, uh, but all related. Um, would you comment on the current level of the 10-year yield and some other long rates out there, whether or not you think they would have a negative effect on the economy? And if not, is there a level that would give you concern? And finally, the third part, other central bankers have expressed concern about what's happened to yields in their countries uh, and even some taken action, but not you. Could you give us your general uh, idea or orientation towards the idea of, of coming into the market and affecting a particular tenor of the bond market? Do you, do you like that idea? Do you not like it? Is it the top of your toolbox or is it something that you think is at the bottom of the toolbox? Sure, sure. So we monitor a broad range of financial conditions, and we're always attentive to market developments, of course. We're still a long way from our goals, and it's important that financial conditions do remain accommodative to support the achievement of those goals. And if you look at various indexes of financial conditions, what you'll see is that they generally do show financial conditions overall to be highly accommodative, and that is appropriate. So that's, that's how we look at it. Um, I would add, I, as I've said, I would be concerned by disorderly conditions in markets or by a persistent tightening of financial conditions that threaten the achievement of our goals. Um, we think the stance of, our, of monetary policy remains appropriate. Uh, our guidance on the federal funds rate and on asset purchases is providing strong support for the economy, and we're committed to maintaining that patiently accommodative stance until the job is well and truly done. Could you give us an idea of how you sort of feel about that tool of being able to come into a particular part of the market and either operating, doing an operation twist or something like that? Is that something you feel to be the top of your toolbox or something that you don't really prefer? You know, we, we, the, we, the tools we have are the tools we have. What I'm telling you is that the stance of monetary policy we have today we believe is appropriate. We think that our asset purchases in their current form, which is to say, you know, across the curve, 80 billion in treasuries, 40 billion in mortgage-backed securities on net. We think that that's that's the right place for our asset purchases. Now we can, we can change them, of course, in in a, a number of different dimensions. Should we deem that that's appropriate? But for now, we we think that our policy stance on that is appropriate. Thank you, Rachel Siegel. Hi, Chair Powell. Thanks very much for taking my question. 
you've spoken about the pandemic's disproportionate toll on Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and other groups in the labor market. And I'm curious if you can speak to specific indicators that the Fed will be using to measure job gains for groups that have persistently higher rates of unemployment compared to white Americans. And relatedly, since you've described vaccines as key to the economic recovery, is the Fed concerned about lower vaccination rates in communities of color? And what barriers do you think exist there? Thanks very much. So which measures? Uh, so we, we, we do... Uh, monitor and uh, communicate very regularly about different uh, labor market, disparities in the labor market, let's say. So the African-American unemployment rate is substantially elevated, um, and so is the Hispanic unemployment rate. So we look at those and we see those as, you know, it's it's slack in the labor market. It's, uh, it's sad to see because th those disparities had really come down fair to record lows since we started keeping the data that way uh, as recently as a year ago, February of last year, we had those, those disparities quite low. What happens in a, in a downturn, though, is they move up at twice the speed of white unemployment. So we monitor those things. We, our tools, of course, affect unemployment generally, but we're going to look at those as, as a form of slack in the labor market and hope that, uh, you know, that there's progress there. And, and this particular downturn, of course, was just a direct hit on uh, on a part of the economy that employs many minorities and lower paid workers. The, the public facing uh, workers in the service industries uh, in many cases don't have a lot of financial assets. They're not ter tremendously well paid. Uh, they might have other jobs and things like that. So this was a, a direct hit on that part of the economy and the, it's the slowest part of the economy to recover. So, you know, we like to see those people continue to get supported. Uh, you know, as we as the broader economy recovers, which it, which is very much doing now, in terms of disparate levels of vaccination, that's um, those are facts, unfortunate facts. They're really not something we we have within our policy uh, toolkit to address. But it, it is it is true though that we, we the data we have suggests that there are, there are significant disparities between different ethnic groups, and um, you know, but that's that's not for us. Uh, that's for fiscal authorities and the government more generally to. To work on. Thank you. Gina Smialik. Hey, Chair Powell. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the fiscal policy support that has come down the line affecting the economy's potential in the longer term, just in the sense that you've talked a lot about the potential for labor market scarring and how that might weigh on our sort of future prospects. And I wonder whether you see that sort of working in reverse. You know, if we pull people back into the labor market more quickly, does that improve our chances? So I do think that um, fiscal policy overall will have really helped us to avoid um, much of the scarring that we were very, very concerned about at the beginning. And I think that's just um, the size and the speed with which uh, Congress has delivered, you know, with the CARES Act and, and since then, has, um, is going to wind up very much accelerating the return to full employment. It's going to make a huge difference in people's lives, and it has already. As I mentioned in my remarks, opening remarks, the recovery has been faster than we expected. Part of that just is... It's very hard to predict, given we've never seen an event like this. But part of it is just the strength of the fiscal response, which I think will will look good over the years. Longer term, um, you know, to to really that's that the, the first part of it is is about avo avoiding scarring, and I think we we've not avoided all of the scarring, but we've probably avoided the worst cases there. And and uh, I hope we keep at it, and we, we will keep at it with our policies, of course, to do whatever we can to make sure that's that continues. Longer term, though, um, what, what it takes to drive productive capacity per capita or per hour worked to raise living standards over time is investment, investment in people's skills and aptitudes, investment in plant and equipment, investment in software. It takes a lot of investment to, uh, to, to support a more productive economy and raise living standards. And that's, you know, that hasn't been the, the principal focus with, with these measures our measures, certainly, and we don't have those tools, but what Congress has been doing has mainly been replacing lost income and beginning to, you know, support people as the economy returns to normal. But th there should be a focus on, a longer-term focus, I think, would be healthy on, on, on the investment front. 
Thank you. James Politi. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powell. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the Eurozone. Um, while the outlook for the U.S. economy has much improved, progress in the Eurozone has been far less encouraging, and it's showing signs of serious weakness due, due to um, the slower vaccination rollout and renewed um, lockdowns and restrictions. Um, how worried are you about transatlantic economic divergence um, and the possibility that, um, that trouble in the Eurozone and weakness in the Eurozone could could drag down uh, the U.S. recovery as it did in a way um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. You're right. The, the pace of the recovery is um, we're having diverging um, recoveries here, as we did after the last crisis. And in this case, uh, as well as the other one, the U.S.'s recovery is, is leading the global recovery. Um, and, you know, we conduct policy, of course, here. Our, our focus is on, con our, you know, our, our objectives are domestic ones. It's, it's maximum employment and price stability here in the United States. We monitor developments abroad and uh, we know that because they know, we know that they can, those can affect our outcomes. So I think U.S. demand, very strong U.S. Uh, demand if, if, uh, if, as the economy improves, is going to support global activity as well over time. Um, that, that'll be through imports. And, you know, when the U.S. economy is strong, that strength tends to be, tends to support global, uh, global activity as well. So that's one thing. I don't, I don't worry in the near term. It, I mean, I'd love to see Europe growing faster. I'd love to see the vaccine uh, rollout going more smoothly. Uh, um, but I don't worry too much about us in the near term because we're, we're on a very good track, very strong fiscal support coming, um, now vaccination going quickly and uh, cases coming down. I think, we're, I think we're at a good place. It's all ahead of us, but the data should, should get stronger fairly quickly here and remain strong for some time here. Thank you. Hannah Lang. Hi, uh, thanks so much for taking our questions. Uh, I wanted to ask if the Fed is planning on extending the same restrictions on bank dividends and share repurchase, I'm sorry, share repurchases that are currently in place into the second quarter. And um, if you're considering at all the scenario analysis and uh, mid-cycle stress tests that were in place last year, this year, and kind of what would make you consider doing something like that again? So we haven't made a decision on that. We're a couple weeks away from announcing that decision. I, I, I won't foreshadow it here today. Um, I will say uh, we're going to continue our data-driven approach. You know that we restricted buybacks and dividends, so the firms are preserving capital. Through 2020, the banks uh, actually increased their level of capital and their level of reserves. Uh, and the December stress test showed that banks are strong and well capitalized under our hypothetical recessions uh, that we that we used in December, which were quite stringent. We're right in the middle of our um, 2021 stress test, and we'll release those uh, results before the end of June. And that layers, you know, very significant additional stress uh, on top of the stress the banks have already absorbed over the past year, uh, with the unemployment rate going to 11 percent and stock prices falling more than 50 percent. So. But all of that, you know, the results of the stress test and the decision on, on distributions, all of that uh, is to come uh, fairly soon, as I mentioned. Thank you. Edward Lawrence. Thanks, Chair Paul, for uh, taking these questions. Um, you laid out the standards to lift off. And back in Ju June of 2020, you said, you know, you're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. But I see seven members seeing liftoff in 2023 and four next year. How how much debate and how can you characterize that conversation has there been about moving off the lower bound earlier than signaled? Well, I, you know, it all depends. We've set out very clear criteria for liftoff, right, where we've said we want to see labor market conditions that are consistent with our estimates of of maximum employment. And that doesn't just mean unemployment, it means a much broader set of criteria. We want inflation at 2% and not on a transitory basis, and we want inflation on track to, to uh, be moderately, to run moderately above 2% for something. Those are the three conditions. Everybody on the committee agrees to that, right? So it comes down to what's your projection for the economy? 
if you want to, if you want to, you, you know, people will have a range of, of assessments for how good the economy is going to be. And, you know, we, we don't, I would say that we're in a relatively highly uncertain situation. If you look at the uncertainty, uh, uh, people, people on the committee broadly say that uncertainty about the forecast is, is very high compared to the normal level. We haven't come out of a pandemic before. We haven't had this kind of fiscal support before, it, totally and all up. So you're going to have different perspectives from committee participants about how fast growth will be, how fast the labor market will hear, how fast uh, sorry, inflation will move up. And those things are going to dictate where people write down an estimate of liftoff. Of course, this isn't a decision to lift off now. We make that decision then. But it's an estimate based on, based on assumptions about growth. And it's, it's meant to be a tool to generally show the public how, how our, our objective function works, how we think about the future. It isn't meant to actually pin down a time when we might or might not lift off. We, we, you know, we're not going to make that decision for some time. The chances are that the economy in that time and place will be very different from the one we think it'll be. So I, um, sometimes with the dots, um, I have to be sure to, uh, to point out that they, they're not a committee forecast. You know this, but it's, they're not a committee forecast. It's just compiling these uh, projections, really, of individual people. We think it serves a useful purpose. It's not meant to, to actually be a promise or even a prediction of when the committee will act. That will be very much dependent on economic outcomes, which are highly uncertain. Thank you. We'll go to Brian Chung. Hi there, Chairman Powell. I uh, wanted to elaborate a little bit on your commentary about the uh, fiscal stimulus. So it sounds like you, I guess, see the case for even maybe more investment, at least from Congress, uh, to support the more productive economy as you answered to Gina's question. So we just had $1.9 trillion in spending. So where do you see the fiscal space right now? Um, do you still, I guess, maybe see the, uh, the, the country in a place right now where it wouldn't be a concern if there were to be more spending at this time? No, so, Brian, it's not up to us to decide what, what Congress should spend money on or when. I was answering Gina's question, which really was, uh, how do we assure uh, lack of damage to if scarring, for example, or lack of damage to the productive capacity of the economy? And I think what's happened so far has done a pretty good job of that. The, but the, really, I wanted to make the longer run point that if to, to work on the productivity on productivity over longer periods, that is that that is comes down to a number of things. But one of those things is investment, investment in people, in their skills, education, aptitude, all of those things. I'm not in any way suggesting that that's something Congress should work on right now or that, you know, that's just not my that's not our job. I'm just saying that that is what uh, what fiscal policy can do uh, that really monetary policy can't do is is invest in the future productive capacity of the economy, raise potential growth. Those things are completely tools that Congress has. And again, I wasn't making a comment at all on the current fiscal uh, setting. Thank you. Next to Michael Derby. Uh, great. Thank you for taking my question. I just wanted to get your an updated view on your uh, sense of uh, your your view on financial stability risks and whether or not you see any uh, pockets of excess out in financial markets that concern you either you know specifically to that that area of the market or as in terms of like the threat that it could propose to uh, propose to uh, the overall economy. Sure. So. As you know, uh, financial stability for us is is a framework. It's not one thing. It's not a particular market or a particular asset or anything like that. It's a framework that we we have. We report on it semi annually. The board gets a report on it quarterly, uh, and we monitor every day. And it has it has four pillars, and those are four key vulnerabilities: asset valuations, debt owed by businesses and households, funding risk and leverage among financial institutions, those four things. And I'll just quickly touch on them. So if you look at asset valuations, um, you can say that by some measures, some asset valuations are elevated compared to history. I think that's clear. Uh, um, in terms of households and businesses, households entered the, the, the crisis in very good shape by historical standards. Uh, leverage in the household sector had been just kind of gradually moving down and down and down since the, since the financial crisis. Now, there was, uh, there was some negative effects on that. People lost their jobs and that sort of thing. But they've also gotten a lot of support, support now. So 
uh, the damage hasn't been as, as bad as we, as we thought. Businesses, by the same token, had a high debt load coming in, uh, and, uh, uh, but, and many saw their revenues decline, but there's, they've done so much financing, and there's a lot of cash on their balance sheets, so nothing in those two sectors really jumps out as really troubling. Uh, Short-term, I mentioned funding uh, risk as the, as the last one. So th we, we saw, again, in this crisis, breakdowns in parts of the short-term funding markets. It came under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, and they've been quiet since the spring, and we, you know, we shut down our facilities and all that. But we, we, don't, we don't feel like uh, we can let the, um, let the moment pass without just saying again that, we, that those some aspects of the short-term funding markets and more broadly non-bank financial intermediation didn't hold up so well under great stress, under tremendous stress. And we need to go back and look at that. So a very high priority for us as regulators and supervisors is going to be to go back, and this, this will involve all the other regulatory agencies. It does involve all of them as well, and see if we can strengthen those things. So that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of a, a broader, detailed look. Thank you. Michael McKee. Mr. Chairman, can you help me understand something about the, the SEP and your forecasts? Uh, the inflation that you're talking about for this year, say, is transitory. Then by 2023, you're back down to 2.1%. There's no uh, forecast for a rate increase for 2023. If you get to three and a half percent unemployment, but inflation's only at two or 2.1 percent, are you willing to leave rates at zero going forward from there, or roughly zero going forward from there? In other words, could we be in a Japan-like situation where rates just stay low because inflation does? Well, again, I wouldn't read too much into into the the March 2021 SEP. Uh, dot plot. Um, remember what it is. It's uh, a compilation of individual projections by individual members. They're all making different assessments. They, they have different forecasts, uh, economic forecasts. Some have more optimistic ones, some less optimistic. Um, and also remember that the SEP doesn't actually include all the things that go into maximum employment, right? It's, it's, it's only, it only includes unemployment. So um, I, I would just say um, we've set out clear guidance. The, the message from the SEP that I would like to leave with people is we set out clear guidance. I mentioned what it was. It's um, inflation up to, no, sorry, it's, it's labor market conditions consistent with our estimates of maximum employment. And that's not just unemployment, it's all the other indicators. Uh, but overall totaling up to maximum employment, it's inflation at 2% and not on a transient basis and inflation on track to exceed 2% or moderately for some time. Those are the criteria. We're committed to robustly implementing that guidance, and um, that's, what this, that's what this says. That's really all it says. Um, we're going to wait until those requirements are met. And, and again, uh, you know, the, the state of the economy in two or three years is, is highly uncertain, and I wouldn't want to focus too much on the exact timing of a potential rate increase that far into the future. I'm just wondering, uh, before 2019, shall we say, you were focused on the problems with having interest rates too low. Now, are you saying we're willing to live with it until we reach these goals, even if you get the future goal on you know, maximum employment? So what I, I, would what I would say is we're committed to giving the economy the support that it needs to return as quickly as possible to a state of maximum employment and price stability. And, um, you know, to the extent having rates low and uh, support for monetary policy broadly, to the extent uh, that raises other questions, we think it's absolutely essential to maintain the strength and stability of the, of the broader financial system um, and to carefully monitor uh, financial stability questions, if that's what you're getting at. Um, you know, we, we do that. We, we monitor them very carefully. I, I would point out that over the long expansion, longest in U.S. history, 10 years and eight months, rates were very low for, for they were at zero for, you know, seven years and then, and then never got above, you know, 2.4 percent two roughly. During that, we didn't see actually excess buildup 
of debt. We didn't see asset prices form into bubbles that would threaten the progress of the economy. We didn't see the things you, we didn't see a housing bubble. You know, the things that have tended to really hurt an economy and, and have in recent history hurt the U.S. We didn't see them build up despite very low rates. Part of that just is that you're in a low rate environment. You're in a much lower rate environment and the connection between low rates and the kind of financial instability issues is just not as tight as people think it is. That's not to say we ignore it. We don't ignore it. We, we watch it very carefully and we don't think, we think there is a connection. I would say there is, but it's not quite so clear. We, we actually monitor financial conditions very, very broadly and carefully and we didn't do that before the global financial crisis 12 years ago. Now we do. And we've also, you know, put a lot of time and effort into strengthening the large financial institutions that form the core of our financial system are much stronger, much more resilient. That's true of the banks. I think it's true of the CCPs. We want it to be true of, of other non-bank financial inter intermediation uh, markets and, and institutions. So I think that's, that, that's uh, you know, monetary policy should be, to me, Provide for uh, for achieving our macroeconomic aims, financial regulatory policy and supervision should be for strengthening the financial system so that it is strong and robust and can withstand the kinds of things that it couldn't, frankly. And we learned that in 2008, 9, 10. This time around, the regulated part of the uh, financial system held up very well. We, we found some other areas that, that need strengthening, and that's what we're working on now. Thank you. Anakin, CNN. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Chairman Powell, could you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between the persistent pandemic unemployment and the expected increase in, infl in inflation? Does the former offset the latter to some degree? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You broke up there for a second. Oh, no. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I was uh, asking if you could talk to us a little bit about the relationship between the persistent pandemic unemployment and the expected increase in inflation. I'm wondering whether the former offsets the latter and to which degree you guys are monitoring this. You're asking about the relationship between unemployment and inflation? Is that is that the question? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, they offset each other, the persistent pandemic unemployment. Yeah, um, I, I think I'm hearing you you're correctly. So yeah, I would say a couple things. There was a time when there was a tight connection between unemployment and inflation. That time is long gone. We had extremely low unemployment uh, in, in, not extremely low, we had low unemployment in 2018 and 19 and the beginning of 20 without having troubling inflation at all. We were at 3.5%. We were bouncing around with unemployment 3.5% to 4%. And it wasn't just unemployment. Participation was high. Wages were moving up. It was a very healthy thing. Uh, and we didn't see price inflation move up. There is a relationship between, uh, between wage inflation and unemployment. But that has not... What, what happens is um, that when wages move up because unemployment is low, companies have been absorbing that increase into their margins rather than raising prices. And that seems to be a feature of late cycle behavior. So we're, we're not, um, when, when we, when we uh, seek to achieve low unemployment, high levels of employment, which is our mandate, um, you know, we think we have the freedom to do that based on the data uh, without worrying too much about inflation. Thank you. Going to Greg Robb. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I wanted to follow up a little bit. I understand what you're saying about the dot plot and, and, and the message you're trying to send with the dot plot, but does the same apply for the taper tantrum? You've said that it's going to take some time to get some fundamental progress on your goals, but it seems like some time could now be any time. Well, so we've said substantial further progress. <clears throat> now, right. uh, if you go back... October, November, sorry, November, December, and January, progress in the labor market slowed very 
sharply. So you had an average of 29,000 uh, jobs per month. If you go back and look at the, 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 the level of job creation before that, it was very, very high, very high. So we weren't making any progress on the labor market from the, the, the level of job creation before that was very, very high, very high. So we weren't making any progress on the labor market from uh, November through January. February, we saw a nice, a nice pickup, a good jobs report, 379,465 private sector. So that's good. It can go so much higher, though, and, and, you know, it would be nice to see, to really make faster progress, that's different from substantial progress, we'd like to see it be, be higher than that, and I think it will be. That's the expectation, as you'll see uh, now, I think, really strong job creation return, not as high as it was in the very early uh, days of the recovery, the reopening of the economy, but nonetheless very strong. Okay, so what, what I'm saying is, to achieve substantial progress from where we are, having had three months of, of very little progress, it's going to take some time. And it's, we, we don't want to get into, I don't want to get into trying to put a, a, a pin on the calendar someplace because it's going to be data dependent. When, when, we see, when, we th when we see ourselves on track to make substantial further progress, we're going to, we're going to say so. We, we understand fully that that test is one that involves judgment. If you remember during the, the global financial crisis recovery, we said we, uh, quantitative easing uh, number three was the test was a substantial improvement in the outlook for the labor market. But what does that mean? Well, it means a substantial improvement in the outlook for the labor market. It meant we would communicate when we thought we had that. This is just like that in a, in a way. What we're saying is substantial further progress toward our goals. We'll tell people when we think, until we, until we say, until we give us a signal, you can assume we're not there yet. And as we approach it, well in advance, well in advance, we will give a signal that, yes, we're, we're on a path to, to possibly achieve that, to consider tapering. So that's, that's how we're planning to handle it. It's not different, really, from, 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 uh, from QE3. And uh, I think we've learned what we've learned from the experience of these last dozen years is to communicate very carefully, very clearly, well in advance, and then follow through with, with your communications. In this case, it's, a, it's an outcome-based set of guidance, as our rate guidance is, and it's going to depend on the progress of the economy. That's why it's not appropriate to start pointing at dates yet. Thank you. Thank you. Don Lee, LA Times. Hi, Chair Paul. Um, um, as you know, household um, Households are sitting on um, a lot of excess savings, and I wonder if, combined with that, you have an unleashing of, you know, pent up demand. Um, how much do you think that would affect that would affect inflation? And would you expect that to be a uh, transitory? We, you know, we um, and everyone who's forecasting these, what, what what we're all doing is we are looking at the at the amount of savings we're looking at. Uh, you know, we have reasonably good data on that, and um, we're looking at uh, the government transfers that will be made as part of the various laws, and we're trying to make an assessment on what will be the, the tendency of people to spend that money, the marginal propensity to consume. And from that, you can develop you, uh, an, an estimate of the impact on spending, on growth, on hiring and ultimately on inflation. So that's that's what we're all doing. And we have, you know, we have, uh, we can look at, at history and we can make estimates and those are all very transparent and public and you can compare one to the other. And of course, we've all, we've all done that. And I think we've made very conservative assumptions uh, and sensible mainstream assumptions at each step of that process. And what, what it comes down to is what I said before, which is there very likely will be a step up in inflation as March and April of last year drop out of the 12-month window because they were very low inflation numbers. That's a, that'll be a fairly significant pop in inflation. It'll wear off quickly, though, because it, just the way the numbers are calculated. Past that, as the economy reopens, uh, people will start spending more. And, they, you know, they, it's, you, you can only go out to dinner once per night, but a lot of people can go out to dinner. And so... And they're not doing that now. They're not going to restaurants, not going to theaters. That part of the economy and travel and hotels, that part of the economy is, is really not uh, functioning at, at, at full capacity. But as that happens, people can start to spend. 
It's also wouldn't be surprising if, and you're seeing this now, particularly in the goods economy, there'll be bottlenecks. They won't be they won't be able to service uh, all of the demand, maybe maybe for a period. So those things could lead to, and we've we've modeled that. Other people have too. We and what we see is relatively modest increases in inflation. So, but those are not permanent things. You know, what will happen is the supply side, the, the, the supply side in the United States is very dynamic. People start businesses, they, they, they reopen restaurants, you know, uh, the, the airlines are, will be flying again. All, all of those things will happen. And so the, it'll turn out to be a one, a one-time sort of bulge in, in prices, but it won't change inflation going forward because inflation expectations are strongly anchored around 2%. We know that inflation dynamics do evolve over time. There was a time when, when inflation went up, it would stay up. And, and that time is not now. That hasn't been the case for some decades. And we think it won't, it won't, we won't suddenly change to another regime. These things tend to change over time. And they tend to, tend to change when the central bank doesn't understand that having inflation expectations anchored at 2% is the key to it all. We, the, 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 having them anchored at 2% is what gives us the ability to push hard when the economy is really weak. If we saw uh, inflation expectations moving materially above 2%, of course we would conduct policy in a way that would, would make sure that that didn't happen. We're committed to having inflation expectations anchored at 2%, not materially above or, be above or below 2%. So that's, I think if you, if you look at the savings, look at all of that, model it, that's, that's kind of what comes out of our assessment there are different possibilities. Uh, I think it's it's a relatively unusual, very unusual situation to have all these savings and this this amount of fiscal support and monetary policy support. Um, nonetheless, that that is our most likely case. And you know, as the as the data come in and the economy performs, we'll of course adjust our outcome based guidance. Will immediately adapt. We think to meet whatever the actual path of the economy is. Thank you. We'll go to Scott Horsley for the last question. Uh, thanks, Chairman Powell. My question is about those supply chain bottlenecks, especially on the goods side. Uh, are they getting better or are they getting worse? Uh, we saw they were sort of a drag on the industrial production numbers we, that came out yesterday. Uh, and what do you expect them to do to prices in, in just in the short run? Uh, you know, to say, I, I think it... I t it's been possible to say, frankly, with any confidence, but I, I would expect it's very possible, let's put it that way, that you will see bottlenecks emerge and then clear over time. And you'll probably see that over a period of time because, you know, really the 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 strong data are ahead of us. You know, you're, you're it, right now that the checks are going out uh, just just now and that'll that'll uh, add to spending. COVID cases are coming down. Vaccination is moving now quickly. You know, the, the really strong economic data is coming. It should be coming, uh, assuming we stay on this track. And that's when you'll really know wh where the bottlenecks are. So, but you, you can see, though, that they're not, these are not permanent. It's, it's not like the supply side will be unable to adapt to these things. It will, the market will clear. It just may take some time. And, and, and some of the answer to that may be price. In many cases, it won't be price. You know, you'll see that people are reluctant to raise prices. You know, it's a little bit the story about, uh, you know, the, the wage the wage Phillips curve does show that as unemployment goes down, wages move up. But companies choose not to try to, to, to pass that, that price increase along to their customers. So you'll see a lot of that here, too, I think. Anyway, we'll, we'll see. But that, that's, that's my basic, basic uh, sense. Thank you very much. All right, 60 minutes in, and Fed Chief Jay Powell wrapping up his uh, press conference and statement after the second Fed meeting, FOMC meeting of 2021. Uh, the big headline, Fed officials continuing to project near zero interest rates at least through 2023, despite upgrading their U.S. economic outlook and the mounting inflation worries in financial markets. The decision coming on a volatile day for investors with Treasury yields surging ahead of the announcement, kind of masking a growing number of officials who saw 
liftoff before them, though Chair Jay Powell stressing this was a minority view. Here's a quote. The strong bulk of the committee is not showing a rate increase during this forecast period, he told uh, our virtual press conference just moments ago, adding that the time to talk about reducing the central bank's asset purchases was, quote, not yet. Having said that, we have seen yields back off all along the yield curve. Ten-year note right now with the yield of 1.63. Two-year note, it is yielding 0.13, so we've definitely seen a pullback uh, along the yield curve. As for the equity markets, we definitely have seen a bump up to their best levels of the session. We are now in the green when it comes to the S&P, Dow, and the NASDAQ. We're going to have more analysis of that Fed decision. Right now, though, let's get a check a little bit more of uh, what are some of your top business stories. A little bit more on that trading day. Here is Charlie Hi, Thank you very much. Bottom line, stocks and records, Dow above 33 thousand history today on the Dow as the Fed chair was speaking. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all advancing S&P also at a record. Yields on longer maturity U.S. debt retreating from more than one-year highs after the Federal Reserve continued to project near zero rates at least through 2023 despite rising inflation concerns. Right to the numbers, S&P up 14 now, up four-tenths of one percent. The Dow up 190, up six-tenths. NASDAQ up 86, higher by six-tenths. Ten-year yield, one 0.62%. Here's Fed Chair Jay Powell from his statement heard live on Bloomberg Radio and Television. Today, the FOMC kept interest rates near zero and maintained our sizable asset purchases. These measures, along with our strong guidance on interest rates and on our balance sheet, will ensure that monetary policy will continue to deliver powerful support to the economy until the recovery is complete. And reaction to the Federal Reserve from Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Cleveland, chief economist at Payton and Regal, interviewed earlier today right here on Bloomberg Business Week. For investors, this is perfect. You have better growth, you have a little bit higher inflation, which is fine, and you have an easy Fed. You could mix in there very easy fiscal conditions as well. So I think this is a very good backdrop for risk assets for, for investors overall. And again, the tenure at 1.62%. Gold up 1.1% right now, up $18 the ounce at 1749 West Texas Intermediate Crude slumping two-tenths of 1%, 64.68 a barrel. So again, let's recap and repeat here on the Dow. 33,028, up 203 points, up six-tenths of 1%. Will we close above or below 33,000 today? Stick around to find out right through the closing bell. And, of course, how will Asian markets react tonight? S&P up 15, up by four-tenths. NASDAQ up 86, a gain of six-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 up seven-tenths. I'm Charlie Pellet, and this is Bloomberg. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. So let's continue with our coverage of today's decision by the Federal Reserve, their Open Market Committee, and Jay Powell's press conference. Joining us right now, great to have back with us, is Stephen Skanke. He's Chief Economic Advisor at Kill Point, former U.S. Treasury and White House National Security Council staff member based in Washington, D.C., on the phone, though, from Missouri on this Wednesday, Fed Wednesday. Also here, Bloomberg Economics Chief U.S. Economist Carl Riccadonna with a recap of the Powell press conference as well. And he joins us on the phone in New Jersey. So, um, Carl, let me start with you. What stood out here? It feels like it's almost a perfect report. <laughs> well, it certainly was uh, a well, well executed. He stuck the landing here. I think the market mm -hmm. is uh, getting ready to test the Fed's resolve against uh, both the backup in interest rates and also some uh, signs that maybe inflation pressures are starting to uh, warm up, at least on a temporary basis. Uh, and so we have seen yields uh, backing up to uh, post uh, or to, to pre pandemic uh, levels, uh, although when we adjust those uh, treasury yields for inflation, we're right back at zero. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, while it looks like a large move in yields, uh, when we take it in the context of uh, how the economy is performing at the moment, uh, it's not uh, the type of backup in rates that could actually derail activity. So uh, I was kind of surprised to see the market largely take this in stride, but but as expected, this is a Fed that is not going to be phased by short-term uh, deviations in the economic data. So they acknowledge that, yes, $1.9 trillion of fiscal stimulus is going to dramatically change the growth profile for 2021. But it's not going to have a long-term implication for either growth or inflation pressures in the economy. So this is a Fed that still thinks it's too early to even talk about talking about the exit. Steve, do you agree with that assessment? How do you see it? And is the Fed right well, in kind right. of their outlook, you know, feeling like we can keep rates low for a long time? 
that's right. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's actually uh, uh, quite phenomenal how, how well Jay Powell uh, navigated uh, around this issue of inflation and uh, what are they going to do and what is their outlook. Uh, I think what was really uh, uh, impressive was that uh, he just, well, not he, but, but the FOMC just went into it uh, uh, head first. Uh, their, their summary of economic projections, they, they increased the growth outlook to 6.5% for 2021 versus 4.2%, uh, unemployment lower at 3.9%. And, and then interestingly, uh, right up front, uh, uh, headline inflation at 2.4% in uh, 2021 uh, uh, and, and then 2% in 2022, core inflation in 2021 at 2.2%. So, so when we see the numbers start to tick up, they're already out there in uh, in front of it. They're, they're saying we expect this, and what we're doing has all of this in mind. Uh, and, and that should take a, a lot of the second guessing and uh, and jitters out of the market when it comes, as it will. Well, and Carl, was there something that wasn't asked that you kind of wish had been of Jay Powell? Is there something that, or after the press conference, you're still thinking, God, I'd like to go back and kind of push him on some point? Well, Carol, uh, the, the, the million-dollar question, or, or maybe we should say uh, multi-trillion-dollar <laughs> question uh, as it pertains uh, to quantitative easing, uh, is this question, uh, the, the notion about what the exit sequence is going to be like? So we, we know from the, the get-go it's pointless to ask him about uh, when they're going to raise rates or when they're going to taper asset purchases uh, because he's going to give those canned answers that are, that are well-thought-out answers, uh, but the, the, that he's been giving for uh, you know the broader course of uh, six months to a year, uh, dependent on economic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So He's not going to come out and say, hey, folks, yeah, I'm going to do no this on this date, that. right? <laughs> Right, exactly. So the, the, as he said in his own words, we're not going to put pins in the calendar uh, mm. on those issues. It depends on economic data. But what is a very important question here is the sequence of the exit. So if we look back to the Fed uh, response after the 2007 to 2009, <coughs> 2009 recession, uh, they hiked rates by about 100 basis points before they started to let the balance sheet unwind. Uh, the question is, will they follow the same playbook this time around, uh, or is it kind of a first-in, last-out uh, approach where maybe they deem the, uh, the the policy response last time around to be ineffective, where they would like to taper asset purchases first uh, and then follow through with rate increases? So that would have dramatic consequences for the financial markets, uh, and unfortunately, we're just not getting that question asked to the chairman uh, just yet. Great point. Uh, Steve, let me put that question to you. Is there something that you kind of wish – you could go back now and, you know, add on to the questioning of Jay Powell or push him on, you know, one particular point? Well, it, it would be really to get a better understanding of, uh, of maximum employment uh, mm -hmm. and the variety of labor market indicators uh, that they're using. It's not just the unemployment rate. It's not just labor force participation. But they, they clearly have something in mind uh, about uh, what maximum employment looks like and how that uh, – has to be uh, spread out uh, with uh, with some equality through the disadvantaged sectors of the labor market, uh, and uh, and they talk about it some, but uh, but never with enough specificity that uh, that anyone just trying to read the tea leaves separately could uh, could come up with a judgment. Um, I understand that they don't want to tip their hand on that, but uh, but I sure would love to ask the question and hear an answer. Yeah. Well, you know, and I've got to just put this to you guys. You know, it does feel like I talked about kind of a Goldilocks economy. Like, could we possibly, Carl, be getting back to that? I think very much we're getting back to that, Carol. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking for economic growth. I know the Fed is taking growth at about 6.5% this year. Uh, my own team is uh, forecasting growth closer to 7.7% wow. for this year. So we have very robust growth numbers, which should drive the unemployment rate lower. Although I should add a, a footnote of caution, uh, those unemployment rate projections the Fed put out there do not necessarily assume that participation in the economy rebounds to where we were pre-pandemic. So keep in mind that even though uh, the last unemployment rate uh, was reported at about 6.2%, uh, if we adjust it for the collapse in participation that happened during the pandemic, uh, we would instead be talking of an unemployment rate closer to 9%. So, uh, you know, those forecasts don't fully take that into account. 
Uh, but back to Steve's point, uh, to answer, Steve, uh, look all around you. You're in Missouri. It's the show me state. Uh, and so Fed <laughs> Chair Powell and his committee, um, they want to see the evidence of wage pressures in the economy. So they wonder where full employment is. Uh, they'll know that they've gotten there. You know, it used to be talking about the whites of the eyes of inflation. Now it's the coattails yep. of inflation, where they actually need to see inflation marching past them uh, to actually know that we've reached full employment in the economy. We've gone through 4% in the recent past. wasn't inflationary. We were at 3.5% before the pandemic set in, and actually we were seeing inflation and wage pressures trending in the wrong direction. So while the Fed doesn't want to put a number around this, it's probably low 3% or maybe even lower territory. Which is wild. Two things, Steve, and then I want you to kind of react to this, but there was two things that came from Jay Powell saying it's going to take time for $10 million to return to work. He also said the time of tight unemployment inflation that tie is long gone. So, Steve, come on in and layer on this conversation. Well, there, there's probably closer to 20 million people who are who are unemployed mm. um, uh, to the point that Carl made earlier. And, and I think uh, I think most recently reported uh, last week is that there are uh, 20 million people still receiving some form of unemployment benefits uh, related to the pandemic or otherwise, uh, and that's a huge number. Uh, and when you when you when you try to count it up, uh, obviously you get, as Carl said, the uh, the reduction in labor force participation, the people who haven't got their jobs back. Um, within labor force participation, the the number of five million people who who left the labor force just to take care of their kids when schools closed, uh, and and all of that uh, comes back together. And and so when uh, when Chair Powell says uh, th this isn't about estimates and guesses that we we want to see substantial actual progress as carl said marching past us uh with higher employment uh, and inflation uh and uh, to to see it moving beyond uh, beyond our target right and uh, I, think I think that's uh, that that's critical uh, uh with, with the concern and care they have about the uh, the employment situation that that really is going to be their focus uh, uh, maybe to the detriment of, uh, of price stability, right. but I think we all hope not uh, for the reason you just said, Carol, you know, that tie seems to be broke. Yeah, and the Fed chief saying that several times that, you know, the Fed is eyeing actual progress, not forecast progress, and saying that the things that they're putting out right now are forecasts. Guys, um, thank you so much. Uh, really smart uh, conversation here. Dr. Stephen Skanke, great to check in with him again. Chief Economic Advisor at Kill Point, former U.S. Treasury and White House National Security Council staff member, with us from Missouri, as we like to say. Carl Riccadonna, the best Chief U.S. Economist at Bloomberg Economics, with us on the phone in New Jersey. All right, let's not forget some world and national news. A lot going on around the globe. With that, here's Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Carol. Authorities say the suspect in a series of shootings at three Atlanta-area massage parlors that killed eight was also planning to go to Florida to attack some type of porn industry. Cherokee County Sheriff Frank Reynolds says they've been talking with the suspect, 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long, who has admitted to the shootings. Uh, he has uh, some, some issues, uh, potentially uh, sexual addiction, and um, uh, may have frequented some of these places in the past. Authorities say the suspect's family helped in his apprehension. Six of the eight victims were Asian, but at this point, authorities do not believe the murders were a hate crime. Long was charged today with four counts of murder and one count of assault. The Secretary of Homeland Security is defending the Biden administration's response to the surge of migrants at the southern border. The situation is undoubtedly difficult. We are working around the clock to manage it, and it will take time but we will not waver in our commitment to succeed. Alejandro Mayorkas told a House hearing today the situation is getting his full-time attention. Mayorkas also criticized the immigration policies of the Trump administration that allowed children to be taken from their parents. He says this administration is not doing that. Well, it looks like taxpayers will have a little breathing room to meet their tax obligations. Those familiar with discussions say the IRS plans to extend the tax deadline for about a month, largely due to the pandemic and 
to tax law changes. The April 15th deadline was also extended last year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts to more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Now back to you, Carol. All right, Nancy Lyons, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're going to do an Irish band, you better do this one. Absolutely. Anyway. Could have done Sinead O'Connor, too, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Not to, you know, not nothing to... compares to you. would have been a nice <laughs> touch. Actually. Both but of them are good. Case, so what do you got for us? Let's talk about what's going on with technology stocks. You know, you've seen all these comparisons over time to... Uh, what we saw in the late 1990s and into 2000 with the dot-com era, the way the tech stocks have run up the past few years. And uh, Jim Paulson, who's the chief investment strategist at Luthor Group, is saying, wait a minute, the comparison really doesn't hold up when you look at valuation. So, you know, he focused in on forward price earnings ratio. So, in other words, rather than taking the past uh, four quarters worth of profit, uh, you look ahead four quarters in terms of what analysts are predicting. And so he compared the forward P.E. ratios on the S&P 500 Information Technology Index with the S&P 500 itself. And when you run those numbers, going all the way back to 1990, you find, on average, uh, the tech stocks have traded at a premium of 19% uh, based on forward P.E. ratios. And you know what the premium was as of yesterday, according to our data? 19%. Hmm. I mean, you go back to 2000, and it was a whole different story. In March of that year, the premium got all the way up to 129%, which is another way of saying the tech stocks aren't all that expensive by historical standards relative to the rest of the market. And I had somebody ask me uh, in an email message, well, you know, what's going on with the S&P 500? Is that more <laughs> expensive than it was in 2000? The short answer is no, it's not. Uh, the forward PE for both the S&P 500 and for tech stocks as a group has come down. It's just what's happened is that it's come down a whole lot more for the industry, which is why you have a much smaller premium now than you did then. If you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it, and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at Bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at Bloomberg.net. And just kind of layers on to a conversation you and I have had a lot about comparing the tech run-up back in 2000 day versus what we're seeing today. Oh, sure. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, companies are making a whole lot more money than yeah, they did back then. It's different. Which, of course, plays into the price earnings comparisons, whether you look at, you know, past profit or projected future profit. So, yeah, it's all of a piece here. All right. Good stuff. Dave, thank you so much. That, of course, is Dave Wilson. All right. Let's get another check on your top business stories and that trading day. Here is once again, Charlie Powell. Hi. Thank you very much, Carol Masser. We've got just about 12 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. Right now, looking at records and also right now looking at the Dow moving above and below 33,000. Keep in mind, only five days since we hit 32K, but right now we've got the Dow at 32,990, up 163 points, up by about five-tenths of 1%. S&P up eight points to higher by two-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ up 42. That is a gain of three-tenths of 1%. And very interesting to point out, too, that year-to-date, the Dow leading the way higher, up 7.8%. By comparison, NASDAQ, which had been the leader or only a few days ago, up by 4.8%. Ten-year yield right now, 1.64%. Gold up eight-tenths of 1%, up $14 a ounce at $17.45. And West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil down three-tenths of 1%, 64.63 a barrel. Zima. So stocks rising to records, yields on longer maturity debt retreating from more than one-year highs after the Federal Reserve continued to project near-zero interest rates at least through 2023 despite rising 
raising inflation concerns. Here's Fed Chair Jay Powell. You heard him live on Bloomberg Television and Radio. As the committee reiterated in today's policy statement, with inflation running persistently below 2%, we will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time so that inflation averages 2% over time and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. And again, recapping right now, U.S. stocks at records, S&P up 5, up one-tenth of 1%. One I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thanks. Well, it's been a little over a year since the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted our lives. Every day at this time, we are taking a look at different industries one, or ways me, of life that I'm underwent not. monumental change in the past 12 months. Here with today's installment of A Year Like No Other is Bloomberg's Denise Pellegrini. What do you bet on when a pandemic shuts Sushi. down most sports? Ito. Table tennis was actually at one point our number one betting sport. Jason Robbins, CEO at DraftKings, says coronavirus lockdowns forced his company to get creative. It was one of the few things going on, I guess, yeah, sports yeah, that sushi. lends itself a little better to social distancing since you're on opposite sides of the table. Fans also developed an appetite for betting on esports and on things like cooking shows. During the height of the pandemic, people shifted hundreds of millions of dollars in displaced spending from travel and leisure to home entertainment like sports betting and even to investing through apps like Robinhood. <laughs> Betting fans are loyal. Odds.com reports America record levels of sports betting in some states during this year's Super Bowl. And Matt King, CEO at FanDuel, says now that fans are finally headed back into the stands after this year like no other, future growth in the sports betting business will come as more states legalize sports betting. I think Privet you'll see another Lushet. five or seven states next year. Denise Pellegrini, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Denise, thank you so much. Just got about eight minutes left, nine minutes left in today's trading session. Let's talk about the drive to the close with David Spica. He's president and chief investment officer at Guidestone Capital Management, $16.3 in assets under management. And their small cap equity fund, by the way, up nearly 18% year to date on par with the rise in the Russell 2000. David with us on the phone from Dallas. David, uh, interesting market year already, and it's only mid-March. Uh, how do you see it, and how does what the Fed say you think play into the market play for the rest of the year? Well, thanks for having me on, Carol. And sure. I would say, yes, it's been very interesting. And clearly the market liked what they heard from the Fed today, a very dovish tone. Yeah. No great right. hikes until 2024, yes. continuing uh, to buy bonds and, 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 and do QE into the foreseeable future. Uh, that's really been the key ever since the market bottom a year ago has been what the Fed has done in terms of stimulus. And now we've got more fiscal stimulus, courtesy of the federal government. That's also fueling stock prices. Ultimately, what we want to see, though, is a sustainable economic recovery fueled by consumer spending. Now, we had weaker than expected consumer spending in February, but that was pre-stimulus. Um, we we're getting better jobs. There was a lot of snow. Forward. There was a lot of stuff going on, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of snow, a lot of weather. We had some bad economic data, but going forward, the stimulus should be a key, and, and we really feel like this year we're going to see very, very strong economic growth, and the market should respond to that. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, listen, we have a story on the Bloomberg. It's one of our most read. Americans have $1.7 trillion to burn in revenge spending binge. And, you know, just talking about, you know, we've been all pent up, not spending money on anything, and, you know, that as the economy reopens, the expectation is that people are going to be out there spending big time. Yeah, that's a great point, Carol. And one of the things that we like in in our small cap equity fund, the Guidestone Small Cap Equity Fund, is the opportunity to see leisure spending take off. Mm -hmm. And so what you saw during the pandemic was a lot more spending on things that could support outdoor activities, watercraft and bicycles and golf equipment. So a company like Malibu Boats that trades at a very attractive 16 times forward earnings multiple, a leader in high performance watercraft production, and a company that's made some really nice recent acquisitions. We I think they'll benefit from this trend, as will companies like Dick Sporting Goods and Callaway Golf. This is something that's going to continue as companies, as individuals start spending that money they've been holding on to over the past year. This is a pretty remarkable stock. Ticker is MBUU. And I have to say, I've been talking and uh, folks I know talking with people who are in the boating industry and sell boats, they said it has never been busier than what they have been seeing over the last year or so, and in particular what we're seeing right now. But you look at MBUU, uh, that was a stock that was trading at 16 bucks at the end of 2015. It's now an $87 stock. It has been consistently higher and higher uh, each year specifically. Another name that you like is um, an IT staffing co uh, company. The ticker is ASGN. Virginia-based. Talk to us about this company. 
uh, yeah, ASGN is a company that provides staffing solutions in the IT industry. And if you think about where the growth is in the economy today, IT clearly is the leader. Uh, we don't want to forget the fact that IT companies and IT stocks are not performing well, but longer term, IT growth is going to be paramount for the growth of the economy. So a company like ASGN that can provide staffing solutions for technology companies um, is going to do very, very well. And they've also got a very attractive growth-oriented M&A strategy that's very additive to their growth. And so that's another company that we own in the Guidestone Small Cap Equity Fund that we're very, very favorable toward. Up 30% in 2019, up another 18% last year. Um, let me also ask you really quickly about Q2 holding. It's down about 15% this year. Ticker is Q2, QTWO. Just got about 35 seconds. It's got a pretty high uh, short position, too. What's your take here? Well, the valuation is kind of steep because they've made a lot of uh, uh, they've got a lot of expenses related to their growth, but the yeah. top line revenue growth is going to be 20 percent or more for the foreseeable future. They provide cloud-based services for small and mid-sized banks, and 70 percent of their revenues are recurring; they're subscription-based. And if you think about where the where the activity is going to be, the banking sector is going to benefit from this rebound in the economy and all the stimulus. And a company like Q2 will be well positioned to benefit from that as well. Yeah, forward-looking PE of 375. You weren't kidding that it's steep. Um, hey, listen, good to check in with you. Really appreciate it. David Spica, President and Chief Investment Officer of Guidestone Capital Management, $16.3 billion in assets under management with us on the phone from Dallas. We have just about three and a half minutes left in the trading day. We'll count you down to the close right here on Bloomberg Radio. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World 
headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. There you have it. Sound of the closing bell on a record-setting day on Wall Street. Folks from Guinness ringing that closing bell on this St. Patrick's Day. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all moving higher. Look at the Dow. First close ever above 33,000. Right to the numbers with the S&P also at a record. 39.74 advancing 11 points on this Fed Wednesday. Up by three-tenths of one percent on the S&P. The Dow up 190. 33,016, higher by six-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ reverse course up 53 points today, up by four-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ 100 index also up four-tenths of one percent. Russell 2000 up seven-tenths of one percent. Dow Transport's up by one percent today. And the SOX, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange's semiconductor stock index, up today by 1.2 percent. Stocks rose to records. Yields on longer maturity U.S. debt retreated from more than one-year highs after the Fed continued to project near zero interest rates, at least through 2023, despite rising inflation concerns. Ten-year yield, 1.63 percent. David Spica is president and chief investment officer at Guidestone Capital Management. He was our guest moments ago right here on Bloomberg Business Week. Clearly, the market liked what they heard from the Fed today, a very dovish tone, no rate hikes until 2024, continuing uh, to buy bonds and, 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 and do QE into the first foreseeable future. Uh, that's really been the key ever since the market bottom a year ago has been what the Fed has done in terms of stimulus. And just getting word out of the Netherlands, exit polls show that Dutch Prime Minister Rutte's party has won re-election. Today again, recapping stocks at a record, S&P 500 index advancing today by three-tenths of one percent. The World Health Organization says AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine should continue to be administered as the benefits outweigh its risks. AstraZeneca's ADRs, little changed. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Wild thing. Think you move me. I got a few moves I know you'll like. Shaking all over. Bloomberg Business Week. Movers and shakers. Shaking. Let's do it. On Bloomberg Radio. All right. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this Wednesday trade, Fed Wednesday trade, of course. Our focus was on Jay Powell and the FOMC with their second rate decision of the year. And uh, Charlie breaking down those closing numbers. For the equities, let's just dig a little bit deeper. We did finish off our highs of the session, did see a move up on uh, the Fed's moves and the Fed decision and those comments by Jay Powell. Specifically, the S&P 500, though, 312 names in the index higher today, 192 lower, one unchanged. If I dig into the 11 major industry groups in the S&P 500, you did have, let me just look here, six higher, Five lower, top of the pack, consumer discretionary up 1.4%. Industrials, a gain of 1.1%. Energy names up nine tenths of a percent, nine tenths of a percent gain also for materials. Financials up seven tenths of a percent. Communication services just up a hair, up two tenths of a percent. Everything else, consumer staples, information technology, real estate, healthcare, a little bit lower, and utilities, bottom of the pack, they were down about 1.6%. All right, let's bring in uh, Bloomberg News cross asset reporter Kriti Gupta, excuse me. She's here in our interactive broker studio. So, Creedy, I know you were saying, listen, I've been all over the Fed today, like we all have been. Um, what stood out for you? I think the fact that the status quo was such a positive for risk assets. I mean, you saw this idea that everyone's putting so much pressure on Chairman Powell, this idea that 2023, we're finally going to get some indication. And he says, well, actually, guys, nothing has really changed. And I think that's a pretty interesting thing that you saw the stock market just buy on that. You saw them buy stocks, you saw them buy commodities, gold, you saw the dollar sink. It was a very risk on mood. But my next question is, well, if the Fed isn't going to change anything, it's not going to provide a catalyst, what is? Well, I mean, is this just, again, you know, investors saying, listen, we need yield. So we're going to go to those asset classes that are going to provide us that because the fixed income market certainly isn't going to. We did see uh, yields back off. But is it just kind of we've seen this movie before? We absolutely have seen this movie before, but I kind of see what I thought was interesting. Yeah. I think I'm going to backpedal here. What I think is interesting is that Chairman Powell did not put the same emphasis on fiscal aid that he put the last time around. Last well, time because was, we just got a 1.9 trillion right, dollar. But pack. I mean, <laughs> Joe Biden has campaigned so aggressively that there's going to be even more aid. There's going to be even more help. There's going to be an infrastructure spending bill. And yet, since that 1.9 trillion dollars uh, bill was passed, all we've heard is about a corporate tax hike that is going to potentially fund 
a spending bill, more aid, we don't actually know yet. And Chairman Powell uh, completely silent on that topic. Well, what's interesting, too, and I do wonder, you know, it's just a case of, listen, investors are out there, they're moving ahead, but there are things that there are question marks on, right? And what we had from Jay Powell today was like, listen, guys, we got an update on the dot plot, right? We have a better indication. And he says, these are forecasts. These are actualities, right? Right. And the actualities will determine ultimately whether or not, you know, and when they start to raise rates. But we got a little bit of a window in terms of the Fed doesn't anticipate anything happening anytime soon in terms of rates. He talked about the labor market, right? He he talked about 10 million. I had a guest who said it's more like 20 million who are still out of work. We've got to work off those numbers. Absolutely. And I thought what else was interesting was he, the comments on the SLR, the fact that he didn't make any comments on the SLR, he said that that was, and for those for our Unpack listeners, who aren't, for us, right? I was for, say, those for our who listeners not. who aren't who aren't familiar, uh, it's a supplementary leverage ratio. I'm going to nerd out here a little it bit. It was Carol. the second question, and Tim Stanvik and I looked at each other like we're already on that. Oh my god! <laughs> All right, anyway, well, go ahead. For 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 uh, reference, I mean, we got a million read spikes just off the word SLR, so that really tells you people are watching this. It's this idea that banks are allowed since the pandemic to take on a lot more risk in terms of buying treasuries, in terms of buying stocks, things like that, that they don't actually have to put in reserve. So essentially, they're over leveraged. The Fed is now at a point where they can say, we're going to either relax those, or they've already been relaxed, and we're either going to tighten those requirements, we're going to make that ratio even, essentially, that you can't hold this much risk without holding this much reserve, or uh, we're going to let things fly, we're going to let keep them relaxed and let banks uh, basically take on even more risk. So that's the idea. The reason this is so important for markets and not just the banks is this idea that J.P. Morgan has come out and said that if those uh, requirements, supplementary leverage ratio, are not uh, tightened again, or, for example, if they are tightened and they're no longer allowed to keep this kind of very loose ratio that they have right now, they plan on dumping their treasury holdings. Now, that for a regular player is no big deal. For J.P. Morgan, that's one of the biggest holders of treasuries, that will play directly into the yields story. We were looking for what's going to push those yields even higher, even above that 1.6 level. This might be that catalyst. And we, looks like Chairman Powell is going to be making an announcement on that very soon. So you will very clearly see the markets react if uh, things don't go the way J.P. Morgan and other major treasury holders want them to go. I'm anticipating that was a great explainer. I'm anticipating there'll be a nice write through on the terminal. It'll be probably among the most read stories tomorrow. And it'll probably be trending on social media because it'll be like, what? What is this? Okay, why do I care? Um, Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. really appreciate it. Bloomberg News Cross Asset Reporter Kriti Gupta. You are listening to Bloomberg. All right, Dave, you're up. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dave. Wilson, where are you? Wilson! Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? We're going for a price on Wilson. Open up the door, it's Dave. Who? Dave. Hey, Mr. Hey, Mr. Wilson, Bloomberg Stocks columnist and editor. Dave Wilson is back with his stock of the day. Dave, what do you got for us? Infuse System Holdings, Carol. It's a supplier of infusion pumps used to deliver fluids and medications to patients in and out of the hospital. Uh, The company has a specialty in pumps for cancer patients. Infuse System was founded in 2005 and was taken public by a blank check company in 2007. Yes, they existed back then. (laughs) It's like, Uh, I love that. is INFU. Uh, the company's shares languished for a decade before rising 50% in 2018. They more than doubled in each of the next two years. While Infuse System has been up and down this year, the shares set a record today after the release of fourth quarter results. Adjusted earnings were more than seven times the average analyst estimate in the Bloomberg survey. Revenue also surpassed the average projection. Infuse System cited growing demand for home health care, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the company reaffirmed forecasts for this year. Uh, the results and outlook sent Infuse System to its biggest gain in about a year. The shares rose 12.5%. Did you see this stock was up 120% last year yeah. and it was up 100 and almost 48% in 2019? Yeah. It's been More on a double. tear. Three years in a row. That's saying something. That's why uh, the company got my attention. Like I said, uh, you know, up, uh, down, different yeah. times this year, but now decidedly up. Yeah. Uh, after today's performance, up uh, almost 19%. Oh, 
Oh, big game, big move. All right, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. Have a great evening. All right, let's get to World of National News. For that, back over to Nancy Lyons. She's in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. The IRS is planning to delay the April 15th tax deadline for a month due to changes in the tax law and the pandemic. The new deadline will be May 17th, according to lawmakers who've been briefed on the change. The deadline was also extended last year. Atlanta police say the suspect in the shootings at massage parlors that killed eight may have frequented the establishments in the past. Captain Jay Baker is with the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office. It sounds to me like these, these, these locations, he sees them as an outlet for him, that something that he shouldn't be doing, and that uh, an issue with porn, and that he was attempting to take out that temptation. The suspect is 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long. He's been charged with three counts of murder and one count of assault. Authorities say they do not believe believe it was a hate crime, even though six of the seven of the eight victims were Asian women. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas told the House Homeland Security Committee the southern border is secure and the unprecedented problems were caused by the damage done, as he put it, over the last four years. Mayorkas said border crossers are being turned back to Mexico to protect against COVID-19. A crisis is when a nation is willing to rip a nine-year-old child out of the hands of his or her parent to deter future migration. And we are not expelling children so that they can proceed with their immigration proceedings and their claims for humanitarian relief under the laws of this country in a safe and orderly way. Committee Republicans blame President Biden for overturning Trump policies and thus bringing on a new wave of migrants. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nancy Lyons, thank you so much. I'm Carol Masser in our Interactive Broker Studio. Joining me is uh, Charlie Pellet of Bloomberg News. Charlie, this is our second most read story on the Bloomberg in the past eight hours. And I feel like we have to cue a little Etta James. At long last, Wall Street sees a path to return to the office. And we have heard so much from the CEOs, especially of some of those big Wall Street firms. Yeah, and let's be clear, though, Carol. I mean, mm. Wall Street has wanted to go back to work for a, for quite a while. Indeed, there have been several attempts. And when I the talk CEOs about global, it, Yes, in exactly. They want to get everybody <laughs> back. And when we talk about global Wall Street, indeed, there have been attempts. And then we've had problems where people, especially last year, would come back and then you'd suddenly get a large number of outbreaks. However, what we've got here past couple of days, word, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase, they've got hundreds of interns set to work in the lenders' New York and London offices in coming months. Citigroup begin inviting more workers back to its offices in July. Goldman Sachs also says it hopes to have more staffers back by summer. Obviously, they are walking a very fine line trying to get people back in the office. Well, and I was just trying to Google quickly on... Uh my terminal here, but didn't a lot of banks do, right, if I'm correct, they did pretty well in 2020. So it's interesting because this story talks about, you know, Zoom fatigue to the exhaustion of jobs colliding with home life. And a lot of bankers are saying the strains of long-term remote work are growing for bosses and underlings alike. So I wonder if this is more a situation, not that the productivity is down or anything like that, or that banks aren't doing well, because I think they have been doing actually fairly well. Uh, it's just a case of people are just tired of this dynamic of workplace, home life, there's no real division. I, I, exactly. And you know what, though? I mean, I could almost hear Fed Chair Jay Powell's frustration today. Case in point, work from home, people on the conference call. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> and that gets grading real fast, and it gets old real fast. Yeah, I think Wall Street had its like first $100 billion trading debt year in a decade, so they did pretty well. Yeah, I know, exactly. Uh, listen, it's a little exhausting. You're losing culture. That's the point. <laughs> All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week, and this is Bloomberg Radio.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. World headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. History for the Dow. Another day of records. Stocks advanced. Yields on longer maturity. U.S. debt retreated from more than one year highs after the Federal Reserve continued to project near zero rates at least through 2023, despite rising inflation concerns. Ten-year yield 1.64 percent right now. The S&P up 11 to a record 39.74, up three tenths of one percent. The Dow rallied 189 points, up six tenths of one percent to close at 33,015. First close ever above 33K. No, we also had uh, the NASDAQ 100 index up by four-tenths of one percent. Again, that 10-year yield worth repeating, 1.64 percent. Gold up seven-tenths of one percent, 1744 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil down four-tenths of one percent, 64.56 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hey, Charlie. Thank you so much. So among our most read stories on the Bloomberg today has to do with the former president, Donald Trump, and his ailing empire. Don't worry, he's still a billionaire, but it is slipping as COVID and the Capitol Hill riot definitely take a toll on his wealth. It's a visual story, so to be sure, check it out at Bloomberg.com as well. Let's get more, though, from Bloomberg News Trump Organization reporter Sophie Alexander. She is back with us on the phone in New York City. So, Sophie, um, this is an assessment of Trump, Inc. in many ways. So how did you go about it in terms of valuation and finding the information? Yeah, so we went out about it a couple of ways to get the income numbers for uh, Trump's businesses. I guess first I should break it down into what exactly Trump's business includes. And, you know, he has a lot of commercial real estate. He has a lot of resorts and hotels. He has a robust licensing and management business. Um, and then, a, you know, a scattering of other properties from a chateau in the West Indies um, to one Seven Springs in Bedford, New York. And so to figure out, you know, how much those were raking in for the former president, we looked at his financial disclosures. And those are forms he has to file every year that he was in office and um, ahead of being in office when he ran for the first time. So we looked at the 2015 one and the most recent one, which was filed in 2021, to see sort of, you know, how it changed from the beginning to the end. And then for the valuation, um, we used the Bloomberg Billionaires Index and all that entails get a valuation of uh, his total net worth. So let's cut to the chase. Commercial real estate, right? This is an important part of his empire, has been for a long time. Big uh, decline uh, from 2016 to 2021. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine why a lot of office yeah. buildings are empty, especially in the financial district and in Midtown, and especially in New York and San Francisco, where to his two most valuable properties are, and that's a 30% stake in uh, Vornado Properties, 555 California in San Francisco, and 1290 Avenue of the Americas in New York. All right. And so talk to me, too, about Trump Tower, which is an iconic building, safe to say, uh, certainly here in New York City. It was cordoned off because while he was in office because of safety reasons. Uh, really, you know, I think safe to say it was once his crown jewel. What about that, the value of that particular piece of property on Fifth Avenue? Yeah, so there's a lot going on with that. Trump Tower is both commercial space on the bottom, there's offices, and then Trump has his penthouse on the three top floors of the building. Um, overall, the the retail space has declined um, because, again, similar to the commercial properties, um, there people aren't shopping on Fifth Avenue anymore, and that's where it's located. Um, so the value of that's gone down. Um, the penthouse has remained somewhat valuable. Um, and then there are a lot of apartments, condos that he no longer owns that he sold off a while ago. Um, but, you know, other people uh, are trying to sell and they're sitting on the market for a really long time because right now his brand's not doing well and Trump is plastered on the front of that building. I want to go on to some of the other businesses, but let me also ask you about resorts and hotels. Uh, the International Hotel in Washington in particular. Uh, he's got the National Doral, uh, Miami. He's got Mar-a-Lago. Like, what's going on with those properties? Sure. It's a similar story. You know, people can't travel right now. These are just the businesses that you don't want to be in during a global pandemic. You don't want to have office towers because people can't work in the offices, and you don't want to have resorts and hotels because 
people can't travel to them and people can't stay to them. Um, so, yeah, revenue has declined from last year down about $26.2 million from 2019 at the International Hotel of Washington. And then at Doral, same thing, and 560 workers in earlier in 2020 were tempor temporarily laid off or furloughed. Some of those people are back now, but a lot of those were became permanent. Hey, one thing I think about when I think of um, the former president, uh, and like many, to be fair, uh, past presidents, uh, Donald Trump liked to play golf. Uh, he also has holdings. That's part of his wealth is, uh, uh, you know, uh, in addition. 19% um, down income change from 2015 to 2020. Again, but although people were saying golf was a great thing to be able to do when it comes to the COVID world, social distancing a lot easier to do. What's the prospect here? Yeah, I think a lot of people did get into golf, and we talked to someone about that, an analyst who said that 2020 um, had some of the most rounds played in um, history uh, because it's something you can do outside and socially distance. Um, but last year, there were still closures because of the pandemic again. Um, so a lot of those properties weren't able to take in money for uh, a good chunk of time. Hey, listen, um, we can't get to all of it, and I do highly recommend that folks go to Bloomberg.com because it is fun. It's it's uh, a great multimedia experience. But there's other things like licensing and management. There's aircraft. Let's not forget he owns planes. There's books. There's entertainment. What else do you think is of note? Um, one of the, the more entertaining ones is towards the bottom, uh, the scrapyard or uh, old businesses, enterprises that Trump had that no longer exist. So there's some colognes on there. There's Trump University, of course. There's Trump Steaks, which was held by, uh, run by Sharper Image. Uh, Trump Vodka, which Max Stapleson, my colleague, did a story on uh, a few years ago. Trump Energy Drink. So you can go and uh, look through those. But yeah, I, I highly recommend people check this out. The graphics are really great. I had no idea that uh, there were vitamins. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. <laughs> there is a lot. Uh, the Tour de Trump bicycle race. Uh, who knew that as yeah. well? Hey, listen, great stuff uh, and a lot of information. As you said, it's a fun thing to go through because it, uh, the graphics on it are, are just a riot. All right, uh, Sophie, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And again, it's one of the most read stories. It's a Bloomberg exclusive story and the data compiled by Bloomberg and uh, Sophie. Uh, Sophie, of course, is Bloomberg News Trump organization reporter, and she joined us on the phone in New York City. Coming up, we're going to dig into a couple more of the most read stories on the Bloomberg. One in particular has to do with what's called the revenge spending by all of us consumers who haven't been able to go out and shop. So what happens next as the world starts to open up? We're going to dig into that in just a moment. And then we're going to talk about semiconductors and chips, what Amazon particularly is up to. You're listening to Bloomberg Radio.
broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, everybody, get ready for some revenge spending. Charlie Pellet, are you ready for revenge spending? I am. Uh, I rarely spend. What can I tell you? You travel a lot. That's going to be revenge spending. Well, that makes sense, too. That's pet up demand is what I'm calling it. <laughs> All right. What's going on in the world All of All right. Well, we've got records. Let's begin with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Big round number there, 33,015, up 189 today, higher by six-tenths of 1%. Record for the S&P, up 11, up by three-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ up 53, up four-tenths of 1%, while the NASDAQ 100 index also up by four-tenths of 1%. But again, records for for both the Dow and the S&P, 10-year yield, 1.64%. Stocks rose to records. Yields on longer maturity U.S. debt retreated from more than one-year highs after the Fed continued to project near-zero rates at least through 2023, despite rising inflation concerns. Gold was up $13 a ounce, up 8 tenths of 1%, 17.44, a retreat for West Texas Intermediate Crude down 4 tenths of 1%, 64.53 a barrel. The Federal Reserve today upgraded its outlook for the U.S. economy. You heard it live on Bloomberg Radio and with more. Here's Bloomberg's Vinnie Del Judice. Wrapping up this month's policy meeting, Fed officials signaled a healthy rebound is on the way a year after the coronavirus caused the economy to crash. We see the unemployment rate dropping below 5% this year, down from last April's record 14.8%. Central bankers once again signaled the benchmark interest rate will hold near zero through 2023. See, this year's inflation bump is short-lived. Let me tell you, nice Bloomberg Radio. Plug Power's accounting errors sent shares of a fuel cell maker plunging today, dragging down its peers as well. Plug Power was down 7.8%. Five percent Today, the company, once a retail darling, has soared more than 14,000, uh, 1,400% 14, over the past year. Again, recapping, equity markets did move higher today. Records for the Dow, the S&P. S&P up 11, up three-tenths of 1%. Ten-year yield, 1.64%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Just want to mention a headline crossing. The vice president of Tanzania saying that the president... Magufalu has uh, died, so that is just crossing the Bloomberg Terminal. All right, do you want to get to something else on the Bloomberg Terminal? This is among our most read stories. It's looking at uh, how here we are, what, about a year after the pandemic and all the restrictions, a wave of consumer demand is coming for everything from apparel to eating out. It's being called revenge spending. I didn't know that this was truly a description, but it is. Uh, let's get more on how retailers, too, are getting ready for all this revenge spending. Kim Basin is U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg News. He's with us in our interactive broker studio. So first of all, revenge spending, it's a thing. It is a thing. It's really just, it's about <laughs> treating yourself, right? Uh, what are you getting revenge on? It's just the fact that you've been home for a year, not able to do anything, uh, not able to, to go out and shop and, and buy the things that you've wanted. So if you're lucky enough to have uh, some disposable income, you've kept your job and everything, these are the kinds of people who, who uh, now want to go out and finally just, just have some, some fun. You know, I just got off uh, a bunch of conversations, came with uh, several economists coming off of the Fed and just talking about the type of economic growth they're expecting for later in the year. But a lot of it has to do with the amount of trillions of dollars of stimulus that have been pumped into the economy. I mean, these stimulus che checks that are going to Americans, this will help bring about this revenge spending. It will. And Americans have amassed about $1.7 trillion in excess savings since the beginning of the pandemic uh, through January. It's a lot. So that doesn't even include <laughs> the, the stimulus that's coming out right now. And uh, consumer spending over the next two quarters is likely to be the strongest of such periods uh, in at least 70 years, uh, or so economists tell us. So help me out, because you've been tracking all this. I mean, people have been doing a lot of online spending while home, but, you know, we haven't been able to walk into a lot of stores. Um, tell me what you're hearing from various retail outlets. And I do wonder, and I love this in your story, that you guys look at China maybe as an indication of what's to come. So if you go back to last April,